Hello, how's it going? <laughs> Come on, more enthusiasm. How's it going? A little bit better. A little Not bit very better. Performant, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks all for joining us today in the uh, performance tuning and production session. Uh, so this session, unlike some of the other deep dives, is working a little bit differently. So we've got uh, kind of three parts of this session that we're going to kind of integrate together. Uh, so uh, James Goff is talking through the first section. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about optimizing Java. So to kind of give us all the baseline. We're going to take a tour through uh, the JVM, all of the different bits and pieces that go on there, uh, and then kind of build into Kirk's talk. Which is just garbage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then the third part of the talk uh, is Sadiq and I. And we're going to be talking on uh, production profiling, what, why, and how. And if there's any time left at the end of the session, we should be trying to do a little mini Q&A or panel with all of us. But we'll just see how it goes and how it plays out. Sounds good. I think the intention is to have two coffee breaks, especially as it's after lunch. So we'll, we'll do my talk and then go for a 15 minute just to revive. <laughs> cool. Absolutely. Fantastic. Handing over to Jim. Sounds good. OK, so in this talk, we're going to go through um, a few different things. Uh, we'll talk about who I am first. <laughs> Very interesting. And then a little bit on to bytecode, how bytecode works. Um, we'll take a look at class loading and uh, how the class loading mechanics operate. We'll also have a look at a class loading example that you can play around with afterwards. Um, we're then going to talk about interpreting and profiling code. This is where a lot of the magic in the JVM happens. Uh, and we'll look at some of the runtime optimizations uh, that get applied. Um, we'll then also look at a tool which kind of, we're going to do all this first bit quite manually, and then we'll look at JITWatch, which makes this really easy to kind of explore what the JVM is actually doing and what kind of optimizations it's making. Um, cool, so, so about me, uh, I think I started programming when I was six. I wouldn't say my code's got much better than that. Um, and that was on a C64 doing basic, um, and then I worked as a Java developer. And one of those things where you, know, you tell people you're a Java developer and they immediately think that means JavaScript. So you end up doing some JavaScript development as well. Um, probably like in, in after that, I started to work a lot in the community. So I've been heavily involved with the London Java community. Um, I helped work on designing and testing JSR 310 with, with Richard. Um, and then I spent four years training. I actually started doing conference uh, speaking and realized I enjoyed it. Um, so I did that for four years almost every week and then realized talking all the time is a bit annoying. Um, so I've gone back to writing uh, code now. So I work on APIs and Java. Um, and I finished writing this book uh, with Ben and Chris Newland on optimizing Java, which is kind of the, the subject of this, this talk, which is now released. So a lot of the things are kind of that I'm going to cover um, sort of in 50 minutes. You can probably spend a long time reading in there as well. Um, cool. So let's start with a picture and build this up to what the JVM is actually doing. So as we all know, and this is a developer conference, um, we, we, take, we take coffee or some other substance. Uh, we sit at a laptop, write some code, and then we have our Java source code. One thing that's quite interesting about this talk is that although I'm going to talk to this from the angle of Java, it could actually be uh, relevant to any language that runs on the JVM, because the bytecode and optimizations that happen on the bytecode are roughly the same. OK, so then um, the next thing that you would run is Java C, or I, I, actually, this is quite funny. So Java C, not many people actually go in and type Java C anymore, right? It's all hidden away from you because nasty things happen if you try and run Java C yourself. Um, the best thing to do like with that as an experiment is just put something in an arbitrary file and then try and compile it. And then, then you will be thankful for things like Maven, maybe. Um, and then you get this class file. OK, so what does a class file look like? Let's, let's have a quick, a quick uh, inspection. So. This talk is going to work on one example uh, called Hello World, of course. It what would it be called uh, other than Hello World? The interesting thing is, uh, and this was only found out by uh, myself and Heinz at um, J. Alba last week, uh, was that there is actually a class called Hello World um, that ships with the JVM. Okay? And it's, it's in like an internal package. Um, but it has a function in it called fib. 
which is a badly implemented Fibonacci function. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it, the, the funny thing is, it's there in Java 8. In Java 9, it's been refactored. So it's not been taken out, it's been improved. So it now has a comment, and they've taken out the ternary operator. So this isn't that hello world, if any of you knew that existed. Bit of an Easter egg, I reckon. Um, this is a hello world that is deliberately designed to push us into some optimizations that we're going to look at later. Um, so if you have a look here, then we've got some main uh, function. Uh, we've got a for loop for 100,000. That number will become important later. Uh, and then we do some printing of ints. Um, and again, that will also become important later because one of the best things um, I've seen, especially while looking at benchmarking, is the best benchmarks are the ones that do nothing. So we need to make sure that the JVM is still computing something in order to make any of this kind of relevant to us. Now, there's this tool that ships with uh, Java called Java P. OK, some of you may have had a look at this before. Um, and what Java P allows you to do, I mean, let, let's just uh, compile this first of all, just so we, I'm not showing you anything where I'm cheating, um, which I might need to do if things go badly wrong. Um, so if we look at Hello World, and we'll use the minus C flag, then what this shows us is it shows us the representation of the bytecode inside the class file. So we can actually really start to look at what this thing is doing. Um, in terms of, like, we, we will go through a couple of bytecode instructions a little bit later so you can kind of get a flavor for what this means. But I just wanted to show you the, the general layout. Okay, so this is kind of, we will, we'll come back and dig into what some of these things are doing before we start to go through some of our examples. I also want to show you um, what's happening with, like, the differences between 8 and 10. So there is a slight bytecode difference, which is, again, Java C doesn't do very much. It's designed to be incredibly lazy. A lot of people think that Java C is like this. It does lots of optimizations, but in fact, the opposite is true. Uh, and this helps lead on to, to our late, the later part of our story here. And, and just, to, just back to the basic, there, is, there are still go-tos. There are still go-tos in our code. We just don't see them, thankfully. Um, so you've got your class file. We'll walk through that in a little bit more detail shortly. And you've got your JVM. So how do we get those class files into the JVM? Uh, and this is where the, the class loader comes in. Oh, maybe I skipped out my slides. We'll, we'll, we'll revert back to the class loader in a minute. I'm getting all confused with all these lights. Um, so anatomy of a class file. Um, if you can't remember, this is one of Ben Evans' um, kind of like, uh, what, how would you say it? Like mechanisms of remembering uh, my very cute animals turn savage in full moon areas, uh, which is the magic version constant access this super interface fields methods and attributes, which is obviously a lot more tricky to remember. But that describes the general layout of the class file. So you've got this magic number that sits at the top. Every, um, every uh, Java class has one of those. That's the 0x cafe babe. Um, which was, I think it was originally from uh, Cafe Dead, and there's a whole story about that if you go back and look at the Stack Overflow post about why that happened. Um, there's the version number. Now, you've probably come across this only if you've done something wrong. <laughs> so the version number usually crops up, and you, you get this major and minor version incompatible. And you just think, oh, Oracle just changed the JDK again underneath me. Um, this is more to do if you're trying to run a version of your class with um, an older version of the JVM. So let's say your runtime is 7 and your build time is 8. So one of the things, again, that Maven does on, on other build systems nicely for us is it helps us to be able to figure out um, you know, getting a consistent runtime and build time environment. There's a whole lot of other things as well in there that basically you, you'd recognize those if you were walking through um, sort of like your Java code. So the actual um, operations themselves are all prefixed by uh, uh, something that describes them effectively. So if we look at our Java P output, and we'll go back to that in a minute, you can start to read what some of the signatures actually do. So for instance, um, we've got the Java P output that says this is a function uh, which returns a string. So you've got the idea of this L is a reference type. Um, or you've got the idea that it's an int, which is a capital I. So these things allow you to kind of like structure uh, what, the, what the signatures actually would look like. Um, and a lot of the operators that we see, if we were to go down into all of them in detail, are prefixed by a type. And then they are kind of grouped into families um, of how those bytecodes would actually work. So if we have a look back at our class file now, we might be able to understand it a little bit more. Um, so yeah, we've got the, the interesting thing, that hello world function I showed you did not have a constructor. So the first thing that, ja well, the first thing that Java C does, as we know, if there's no default constructor, it will supply you one. So it gives you one of those for free. 
Um, if we go and look inside our main function, then we start to see what, what's actually going on here. So we're doing some operations on the stack. You can't really see the, the pointer, but these three here, where we're effectively loading our values in ready to operate. So we're loading in the constant um, of 100,000. If you remember that, that's from our, our loop. And then we're doing an if compare greater than equal to, and then we're loading in the number from the loop and invoking the printint static. Okay, so that iLoad one will load the int, which is then taken off by running this function. Uh, we then do an increment by one, and then we go to two, and we just go round and round in that, that loop. It's, it's almost, you can almost read it as though it was Java code. Um, it's because it's very similar. The thing that's not so similar is the stuff that we've got inside printint. Um, and this is something that has changed in Java, between Java 8 and Java 10. So, for, for example, if you used to use the string append operator, one of those magic things that used to happen was underneath, behind the scenes, a uh, string append would get converted into a string builder. So, you know, kind of those old things where you don't want to keep concatenating things together because you've got loads of strings that you create and it's sort of wasteful. Um, now what there is inside Java 9 onwards is there's this new factory which is basically um, concatenating with constants. And that allows you to take like, lots of constants and bring them all together uh, using invoke dynamic. So for those of you that have, have been through or, or looked at the JVM in the past, you'll know that the opcodes and sort of like uh, bytecode in Java has not changed almost since Java 1. It's been very consistent, except for the addition of invoke dynamic in Java 7. And although Java 7 added invoke dynamic, there was no way you could actually get Java to emit it until lambdas. Okay, so now, now invoke dynamic takes a, more of a shape where we're using it for other things as well as just for, for lambdas. And if you were to do Java P on the same class uh, using Java 8, which we can do, so if I just switch to Java 8 here, uh, run Java C on Hello World, and then we come back to this, then what you'll see down here is a slightly different story where we've actually got um, a lot more bytecode generated for the same thing. So this is a, an improvement that's happened between eight and eight and nine. Okay, so it's all it's all good having a look at this stuff on disk. It's a little bit dull. It's kind of the same. It's very similar. We don't. We, and and this is the kind of the key point of this first part. We don't actually change very much um, in terms of the bytecode instructions by using Java C. There's a little bit going on there, but not a great deal. Um, and this is where we start to really see things happening. So just think of Java C as being like a straightforward translator. It takes your Java code, it puts it into the in the class file, that's your standard structure, uh, and then your JVM, the JVM is where the magic happens. Um, okay, so the, the class loader is the first thing uh, that we encounter. And the job of the class loader is purely to load classes just before they are needed. How many people have recently seen a class not found exception? Okay, there are, there are not many hands, and that's, that's a good thing. That's because we all use really nice build systems now. Um, for, for, for many years when I first started programming in Java, um, this would be a regular thing. <laughs> and that was because, well, build systems weren't as good as they are now. Hacking things around in Ant and that kind of thing. Or GMake, if you ever built anything using that, which is totally inappropriate <laughs> for Java. Um, and what happens is it takes that class file, so the one that we've written, and it converts it into a class object. So that cl class object is our representation inside the VM for defining what that class should look like. Um, for if you've got any statics, so statics being only existing on the actual class itself, those would also live on the class object. Now, I, w I really want to stress with this how dynamic the JVM is. So when it's pulling in these classes, it's just as it needs them. If it's not on the class path, well, then you're in trouble. Um, to demonstrate this, I, I built a small tool, which, um, again, I can share the link, link with after. Um, but this is something that I call the watching class loader. And it was designed as a demonstration to show people learning Java for the first time uh, some of the crazy things that you can actually do with Java. So there is a class loading element to this, but it's also kind of fun as well. Um, so I'm going to run my watching class loader. And what this does is it just watches a directory. And there's, the, the, there's no classes loaded in here at the moment that are outside of the JDK. So if you were to type in demo, which might give you a hint as to what I'm going to call my class in a minute, um, there's a basic REPL here that's saying, oh, class not found exception. I, I don't know what that is. If I now go into Finder, and I apologize, you might, might struggle to see this a little bit at the back. Um, I have in a, here a file called demo.java. Um, and what I do, 
is I drop this into here, and hopefully, if, if, if my Mac is kind and picks this up, which sometimes it's not, there we go, it's actually done something really interesting, and this is, this is kind of like the power of the JVM in my mind, is that it's taken demo.java, it's compiled it on the fly into a .class file. Inside the same JVM, there's nothing going on with Java C. This is uh, part of the build, the build tools that live inside the JVM, and it's loaded it into the same virtual machine. So now if I was to type in demo, I, I see that just using reflection to tell me what the methods are, I see set A and get A. So this is kind of funky. So what, what I could do here is, and you can do if you write your own custom class loader, is you can actually get um, sort of bytecode from anywhere, and you could go through any process you want to create it. Um, would I recommend you use this in production? No. But, but is it kind of cool in showing what, what the class loader is doing? Well, yeah, it's just a different resolution other than the class path itself. So normally all this stuff is pre-compiled, but this just kind of shows the things wandering through uh, the, different, the different stages here. And that you can run almost like Java can compile itself and, and load it in. OK. So once things come out of the class loader, they go into the method cache. And from here, this is where Java lives a kind of unfortunate history. Oh, I think it's kind of cool. But unfortunate in the sense that this is where a lot of people's like, mental model of Java actually stops. You've got some bytecode that you've loaded in. You've executed it using your interpreter. And that's the way that things will carry on working forever. Um, this is no longer true. Okay, this, there is a whole, in fact, to the major portion, especially with Hotspot, which is what we're going to talk about, um, that the runtime is doing a lot more from here on. Um, and it's actually gaining some quite cool advantages by running this interpreter here. So just to, just to give you, a, again, a, a small insight, let's run, um, let's run some timings. In fact, let me show you what these magic timings are before we run them. So we're going to run Java in three different modes on our Hello World. Okay. We're going to run it in fully interpreted mode. So let's just see what happens when we run the code interpreted. So minus x int will force it into interpreted mode. Um, then we're going to compile everything up front. So we're going to use a minus x comp flag to do that. So we'll basically compile everything and then run it. And then we're going to use the standard tiered compilation mode, which I'll talk about what that means shortly. Uh, and we're going to just time them. Right, okay, this is not an accurate micro benchmark. There are going to be lots of caveats. But it's just to give you an idea of the orders of magnitude that we're playing with. Okay, so interpreted mode takes around three seconds. Compilation of everything, about 2.2 seconds. And then tiered compilation mode is 0.612 seconds. Now, okay, I'm kind of cheating a little bit here. Because if I was to let this program run for longer than three seconds, then maybe the compilation benefits would pay back. Um, but my job here is to tell you that that wouldn't be the case. And I'm going to kind of like demonstrate to you why. Um, but yeah, this is, this is kind of interesting. And I think if you've, if you've come from a C++ background, this bit might be a bit, you kind of expect almost the compilation piece to be quicker. Obviously, we could, we could look at the time spent compiling there and take it out of the process. And also things like Graal are now making things interesting as well uh, and, and see what kind of figures that we would get. So initially, what happens then? So we want to get to this state where things are running at that 0.3 seconds. Uh, bytecode is initially fully interpreted. So when your JVM starts up, at least in most, you know, standard version of Hotspot, uh, you're going through inter using just interpreting bytecode, standard bytecode interpreter. Um, and it converts each, each instruction one by one to the corresponding machine instruction. Uh, and then the idea here is that if you're not using some code, you don't t spend time compiling it. As we start to look at even just this very simple example of Hello World, you will see that the way that Java tends to work is it just pulls in a massive string of dependencies um, in a different way each time. So there'll be things that we do pull in, things that we don't. And when we do pull those things in, how do we make it e efficient? So what does it, what, why would we bother with this interpreting step? What, what does it really give us? Um, so when we're, when we're interpreting, we have this opportunity to actually inspect what is happening at runtime with your code. So remember, this, the, the JVM doesn't know like, which classes you're going to pull in. In fact, you could pull in anything at any time, and that would be the first time it's encountered. 
So each execution of, the, of, of even the same application, depending on how it's working, might actually work in slightly different profiles. Um, and that's what we see in many cases. And there's been like an argument against ahead of time compilation. So you, you will look at your profile for each individual uh, invocation of the whole ecosystem. And this profiler, this is like the, the JIT profiler. We'll talk about other profiles later. It's watching the, the paths that you're taking through the code. It's watching the way that you're chaining methods together. And it's looking to make the best possible optimizations that it can. And this is all like kind of done at runtime. Once it makes that decision and it hits a threshold, so you, there's a configurable threshold. The default is 10,000. So after, that's kind of why we're pushing things to 100,000. Once you hit that 10,000 threshold, then you can actually start to make some of these optimizations. It becomes a hot path through your code, which is effectively where that, the naming comes from. Um, the one thing that kind of scared me the first time I saw this, but it makes a lot of sense, is later on, if, if, if the JVM realizes that, actually, you know what? I made a mistake. Um, this doesn't work anymore. In fact, it's not even as quick as the bytecode uh, or the interpreted version. Then it's able to back out its own optimizations, revert back to bytecode, and then kind of reassess the situation. So there's lots of clever profiling and re-optimization that's happening inside the JVM. So this is something that we call profile-guided optimization. It's really taking a look at your code and figuring out what it's going to do. But what are those optimizations that it does? And that's kind of like the part that we'll look, we'll look at now. So in terms of profiling code, it's looking for those frequent execution of code blocks. Um, if you were to do something like computer science, it's got that counter in there that would, would pick out the number uh, usually referred to as a barometer. And once that threshold is reached, that's when it begins to um, sort of make the traces and figure out how it can actually go and do those optimizations. Um, and then you've got this two-step two process. So you do profiling, and then you emit that kind of machine level, those machine level instructions, uh, and then you pop them into a cache down here, which is called the code cache. There's some really interesting things going on in this space, because all this happens inside the JVM. Um, if you were to go look at something like OpenJ9, which is IBM's open source version of, of, the J, of JVM, you will see that they're starting to look at some really interesting um, sort of extra solutions around this. So one of the things that they're looking at is, we mentioned ahead of time compilation is sometimes not optimal or sometimes a bad thing. So they're experimenting with actually doing that, where they take some of the logs from the previous run, and that allows it to boot up in a quicker amount of time, and allows you to dedupe some of the memory. The other thing that they're also looking at is actually having an off-process JIT. So this JIT compilation is all inside one process. But imagine if you had 10 to 20 of the same application running across different containers. So if you could go and say, hey, can you compile this for me? And it goes, yeah, here you go. There's the, there's the actual compiled code that you need. Then there's some kind of crazy things that could happen there. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, but that's an interesting space to look at if you are, if you are generally interested in this and also interested in um, sort of cloud computing. Both of those things are aimed at reducing memory footprint and time spent on a single container. So I, I'm talking about all this magic, effectively, that the JVM is doing. Can you see what the JVM is doing? Uh, and the answer is yes, um, you can. So you can use a series of flags. And again, I don't expect you to remember all of these. And I've, I've actually got them all in, uh, in shell scripts. Uh, but the main one is, is that we're, we're going to use tiered compilation. Tiered compilation basically is that interpreting, and then it's using the different compilers. So there are two different compilers that the JVM could use. Um, and, and it uses various different ones depending on what it's trying to achieve. Uh, for instance, if you use the C1 compiler, which is a little bit lazy, it might say, well, I can compile this, and this is this basically as efficient as I can make it. And then if there is an opportunity to then go back around and make it more efficient, then C2 can kick in. But you make those decisions, again, based on whether there's any value or utility from doing that. Um, so yeah, use a print compilation flag, and then you will start to see the different things that basically you can see here, the task number is referring to where it is on the compilation queue. So in, on the compilation queue, you, you, you submit a task and say, you need to compile this. It's running on a separate thread inside the JVM. It emits the, um, effectively the machine instructions that you can then uh, sort of, you would then use. Uh, there's a couple of things you have to be careful of. So things that might have exception handlers, or they may declare synchronized, and those need to be treated slightly differently uh, when, they're, when they're going through for uh, compilation. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool is that you might see some of these native method wrappers. So 
in, in parts of the JVM where it's more efficient to have a native implementation, so think of mathematical functions or computations, then that can be implemented and basically when you do the compilation, it just wraps that native method for you. Uh, and then finally, the, probably the, the most interesting, we will come back to this, is the percent sign. So most JVM-based applications are actually running in a loop, okay? because otherwise they'd, they'd quit quite quickly. right? They're, they're going around and they're polling against something or they're, they're waiting on some, something to happen. And that means that the main body of our code is going to be inside a loop. Now, if it's inside a loop, how do we kind of replace it with the corresponding non-interpreted version? Because that's likely what our application is going to be doing over and over again. Uh, and this, basic, this, this uses a, a notion of something called on-stack replacement. So it's actually capable of like, running through your code interpreted, even if it's in a loop, stopping at some point where it's safe to do so, and then pointing you over to the, to the native instructions. So that's really quite cool. And the other thing that you'll see if you look here is there's a whole series of things being pulled in from the JVM. So even things that, you know, OK, I've written Hello World but I'm using things like stream encoder, write bytes, print stream, buffered output stream, all those kind of things that you probably wouldn't, that at least I wouldn't naturally think of as being used behind the scenes, are brought in and, and effectively compiled for you. Uh, there, this is the really nice view of this in JITWatch that we'll take a look at. So if we were to go run this uh, again just on our example, we can take a look at print compilation. This is just the same flags that we had on in there. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting to, to note here is that um, actually, let me just let me just do this. Let me just because we recompiled for uh, Java eight, so let's just recompile this for Java ten. Otherwise, we're just kind of seeing similar things to what we saw before. And actually, oh look, everything all changes. You remember, it's not all that buffered output anymore. The things that you're starting to you know, bring in as well is you need to, all these things using method handles and linking and invoking is all kind of coming into this as well. So that same code has, has changed. And the idea is, is that, again, moving from, this is probably one of the biggest leaps in Java that we make uh, in terms of like putting in a new byte, a new byte code instruction um, and then sort of going through and executing it, like, you know, and changing the way things that happen. But this is... The, the thing I really want to get across here is, is that your, the code that you write, you know, kind of when you're uh, writing your Java code, is nothing like where it looks like when it's executed. And in fact, that might even change. And it might even change from run to run. So it might be optimized in a different way or change in a, in a slightly. So it's all really kind of nice magic to make your code incredibly fast. I mean, that's one interesting thing. I mean, I think even with some really poorly written Java applications, you actually end up seeing that they still perform reasonably well. And you're kind of looking at going, how does this 4 million line Java code base even work? And somehow it does. I wouldn't say where I saw that. Um, but it did work. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> to, to some definition of work. OK, so, so that's fine that we can see the compilation steps. And that, that's basically the translation into our um, sort of assembly level instructions. Um, but what else does it do? Because anybody could do that. Uh, and this is, the, this is the piece where I think things start to get very interesting when you're starting to do chained invocation. So let's, let's go back to uh, C++ land, or maybe even just standard computer science structures, where what happens when you invoke a function or a method? Well, you have to create a new stack frame. So you create a stack frame on, on, on the free stack space. You copy those values ac across that you're required to, to operate on. Um, you then sort of start your execution. Once it's finished, you, put the, you pop the stack frame, and then you go back to the last position with any return values. So if you're inside a loop, like we were, calling print in, that's quite a lot of overhead to just keep having to like, pop out and go call that, call that function. OK, so, so what, what can we do here? Uh, and this is where something ca called inlining comes in. Now, this is different to something like C++ inlining, where you statically give a hint to the compiler and say, hey, I, I would like you to inline that, please. And it ignores you unless you've got the right optimization level set. This is actually looking at where you're making those calls in this run of the JVM. And it will bring that code outside of being called on a new stack frame and actually just call it inline. So this is where you start to, to wind things into one kind of continuous block of code. Now, what that allows, if you think about it, when people ask me, well, oh, Jim, what, what's the main thing I should do when I'm thinking about performance? Um, the first thing to do is just write really small functions that do very specific things. Like write, you know, don't think about optimization. Like Kirk and Richard and, and these guys have got 
plenty of tuning tips that you can use uh, w- once you get there. Well, he, he has really, don't listen to him. <laughs> and uh, the, the thing is, that, you, know, you shouldn't really be thinking about that too early. That's obviously the premature optimization is the root of all evil and all the rest of it. So just try to think of writing good code. And then the rest will, will kind of either happen at runtime or with a bit of uh, gentle kicking of the uh, JVM. So you can actually print out the inlining as well. Uh, and you start to get uh, like a series of how these things were, were inlined. And this is, again, for, this is Java 8 on the slide. I can show you Java 10 on, on, the, uh, on the console. Um, and you can see that, okay, that we inlined this native method. Uh, th- this was inlined because it's hot as well. These are the things that you probably want to watch out for. Corley is too large. So you can't actually inline things that are over a certain size. Um, there are other restrictions when it comes to inlining as well. Uh, so there are only so many places where you can inline the same method to. So when we talk about compilation and, and things being compiled down to uh, sort of their machine level instruction and put inside the code cache, that is done on a method by method basis. Okay, and then it can be inlined into, you know, that code can be inlined into something else. Um, but you can't do that everywhere because what happens if it needs to enroll an optimization? All of a sudden you're like, oh, you know, this, this function that I call everywhere, I now need to go back and back out all of my optimizations. That sounds worse than a full GC. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can, we can take a look at the Java 10 version, but you can see this here down here, already compiled in a big method, so it doesn't bother. Um, the other thing that you might have, and again, uh, you, you might have some sub-expressions where you're constantly calling the same thing. You're constantly re-evaluating um, the same function call to get some value. And you can look, you couldn't know this by doing static compilation, but at runtime it's able to do infer- inference and say, actually based on the analysis that I've done on, the pro- on, on this, this area of the program and the tracing and profiling that I'm doing, this is always going to be the same thing. It's never going to change. So rather than sort of like reevaluating, it will look for those constant sub-expressions and replace them with the, either the value or even just how to, to, to kind of like call to the remote piece of memory that contains the value. So that's another cool thing, again, that you, you only get this at runtime. There's not really a way to do this without running your application. OK, the other one that happens that's, that's quite, quite useful is dead code elimination. Now, the way I thought of this at first was incorrect. So let me, let me tell you what I used to think of dead code elimination. I've written some unreachable code, and it can't be, you, know, you can't execute it. I mean, the IDE is going to tell me about it. It's going to go, hey, Jim, you've written some code here. This is stupid. And it might throw a warning up. It might do, you know, kick and scream at me till I delete it. This isn't really what this means. Um, this is more to do with um, code that's in your application that is never used from a runtime perspective. So for instance, if you use something like Spring, and you have all of these classes that have lots of different configuration modes depending on how you're using it, which is you know, fine. Uh, one of the things it might be is, oh, if you're using Sybase or DB2, do one thing. If you're using Oracle, pay some money and do another thing. So those two things would happen. Um, but the nice, thing, the nice thing that this does is if you've got some switch there, some like variable that kind of says, well, this is now set and never changes, you've actually got code at runtime that's no longer needed. So you can cut that code out and just throw it away. And then that reduces the size of the method that you need to have inside the code cache. Now, sometimes it can be quite aggressive at doing this again, and it can always revert back to the interpreted version if it gets it wrong. So this is, again, it's, it's a really cool um, feature that from, from runtime execution, you're shrinking out the things that you don't need. Uh, f- if you've ever seen a, a huge linked C++ application, you can't do that. You know, you've got to kind of effectively, you bring everything in because you, you don't have the runtime to be able to figure out whether you're going to use it or not. So there's one thing, again, for just reducing the code cache size. So one of the things, if you think about when we're programming, we don't really think about registers. Well, not unless we're kind of going down to that mechanical sympathy level where we're trying to verify if something's in a register. Um, what the JVM will do is it's, again, going to use some informed decision based on the profile of, of what things are being used that, that should be promoted into register memory. So it will make those decisions for you, and it will improve your execution speed. Uh, there's another example that we'll see where when you use loops, uh, yeah, this is the, the one where we use loops, this loop invariant code motion, you've got often write loops where there are things inside that maybe don't impact the outcome of the loop. So for instance, you, you maybe process something that could be hoisted above the loop and just co- computed once. Um, 
This happens a lot when you know, you're kind of working on legacy code bases, probably. You've just put something in like where it, where it makes sense from a locality perspective when you're writing code. But then actually, you know, the calculation or maybe in that particular iteration or execution of the JVM, you don't, you don't need to have it inside the loop. So it would be hoisted out and make that decision again for you at runtime. So now your overall loop is improving in terms of performance. Um, <coughs> OK, so this one is, is, is really quite key. If you've not come across this before, uh, this is called escape analysis. It's not a new, um, it's not a new idea. Uh, it's, it's fairly new in Java, but it's, it's not a new idea in terms of compiler theory. So if you were developing Java in, on, on 1.6, when it got to version, I think it was 1.6.26, like this magical minor version upgrade where nothing really changed, but the whole world changed. So he's very excited about this. Um, this idea of escape analysis was turned on. And a lot of applications actually improved in performance on general between 20 and 30% without, without changing any code. I said, like, oh, what, what, what would be such a big overhead that you could increase performance by 20 to 30%? And if you look at the different parts of the JVM, it's probably something to do with garbage collection. But it's not actually changing garbage collection in terms of like the algorithms or what the garbage collector is doing, this is actually more concerned with not generating garbage where you don't need to. So if you think about it, you know, a classic question, which I still ask today because I'm really mean, classic interview question, where does Java allocate objects? And then the, the immediate answer you get is on, on the heap, on the heap, and you go, and? And like, what do you mean and? This is all I know. This was in my textbook when I was at university. Um, Escape analysis allows you to now say, this object, it never leaves this scope. It's, it's created, maybe it's created inside a loop, or maybe it's created inside a method and doesn't allow, it's not allowed to escape. So what about if I just put this on the stack? And this is where the JVM does basically stack allocation of objects. So if it's not on the heap, the, JVM, the GC won't care about it. So if the GC doesn't care about it, when you unroll your stack frame, then that object is removed. So it's like automatic memory management in C++. It's, it's, ver it's very nice. And, and that reduction, basically, um, I'm not going to go too much into Kurt's talks. He'll talk about this. Um, there's this miserable thing called high infant mortality, where basically a lot of objects that you create die very quickly. And often that le leads to problems such as uh, premature promotion, uh, pressuring Eden, so you have to work really hard because you've got lots of objects that you constantly need to recycle. Uh, and this just avoids that altogether. So it, it just alleviates the pressure on the, the GC subsystem. So that's kind of nice. And if you want to answer a good interview question, this is always a good one to, to go down. OK, loop unrolling. <laughs> this is really funny. You know when people tell you you should refactor your code? I really should refactor these slides. Um, because every time I say, if you were going to write a series of responses, you would do it like this, and you put it in a for loop. So when you add a new response, it's all kind of good. Obviously, you would use an enum there. Um, but anyway, I have not refactored my slides. So if, if we were doing something you know, really old school, Java 1.4, then this might be how I've written it. Um, we don't want to change writing code like this. We want to be able to, uh, at runtime, go, well, actually, you know what? This, this loop is it's, it's, it's a for loop. It's, it just can unroll that to be the simple, like, each line is the, the body of what the loop iterator would have done. Um, in terms of benchmarks, there are some interesting micro benchmarks that do kind of look at this. Again, don't trust micro benchmarks, but if I'm telling you about them, then they might be somewhere near right. Um, so we've got basically two micro benchmarks here, one that's using an int and one that's using a long. It's just walking over the same um, data array of random numbers and summing them together. So this is the um, throughput in operations per second on the int, so 2423, uh, and it's almost what, 1469 on the long version, because longs can't be unrolled. So you can't loop and roll a long, because there's all kinds of uh, different safe points and, and bits and pieces that get added into the loop to make sure the JVM isn't trying to optimize down a, a really kind of like complicated path. So there are, different, there are different cases where you can do loop and rolling that give you significant performance. Um, this isn't me, so I wouldn't claim for it to, to, to be myself. Um, but Chris, who's one of the authors on the, on the book, I was kind of talking about this, and I thought, well, that's kind of a bit boring, isn't it? It's like loop and rolling. And surely that doesn't do very much. Um, but he was actually talking about a situation he'd seen where 
the JVM had managed to loop and roll a ray tracing algorithm. So basically, rather than having two nested loops, it was straight line execution of code, which obviously gives you a significant performance advantage when you would have had complicated data sets and many iterations. Right, yeah, so, so, so in summary, good, good hint from Kirk there, so forget it. Um, so you can enroll ints, chars, and short loops, that, and you can remove safe point checks. So in int loops, you can remove those safe point checks when you enroll. Um, in terms of what you don't have to do, remember that go-to that I showed you and said, yay, we still have go-tos. It all is good. Well, those go-tos can be quite costly when you start thinking about different prediction and actually going back um, in terms of your code. So when you, when you start looking at that at a more um, mechanical sympathy level, then you're going on these kind of idea of a back branch. And if you're doing that, then you're going to increase the cost of like, your execution effectively by, by looking at that path. Um, and it reduces the work needed for each iteration. So iteration, even in the standard iterator, is creating new, new, um, new pieces for each loop and incrementing and all the rest of it. OK. So one other thing is this really complicated word, monomorphic dispatch. That's, again, if, if you want to sound cool. In fact, that should have definitely been the name of one of the beers at, at the DevOps uh, party, a monomorphic dispatch. <laughs> so if, if, you, if Hotspot ca encounters a call site, um, you have to remember that in Java, everything is a virtual function call. And what I mean by a virtual function call is it kind of goes back to C++, where you're going to look up where the method is you need to invoke through a vtable. So a vtable is kind of a data structure where you go to the parent class and you see if the method's there. And if it's not, you go to the parent class to see if the method's there. And you kind of like chain up together. Um, in C++, there's an option to statically bind, which means you could just say, always execute this function. But then you can't do OO. So it's kind of a, a trade-off in that direction. You can use templates instead. Um, so in this case, you know, the JVM actually, with, with some research, and a lot of the um, pieces in Hotspot and then the optimizations we make, come out of empirical research. It's just looking at how applications work and looking at how optimizations can potentially be made. And in this case, it's, it goes back to like that example where you have an interface, but it's, it's very likely in one system that you're only using one concrete implementation of that interface. You're not necessarily using different versions of, of the same. I don't know why I'm thinking about animal classes now, but something, something's coming back from learning OO at uni. Um, so, if you only have one, then why do you need to go through the vtable and do all these lookups just for the case of it being uh, sort of like fully OO? Uh, and the way that this works is that Hotspot can optimize the vtable lookup. So it's able to collapse them together so it only does like effectively one hop after the first invocation. Again, this is something that you, can, um, you have to be careful of because obviously we know that class loading is dynamic. I could just load in another subclass now, and then things could go really scary. So again, um, there, is, there is the ability to back out that optimization using class loading tricks which invalidate the monomorphic dispatch. It goes, oh, hey, if you're doing that, you shouldn't, because I'm going to give you something else into the, into the system that will upset you. So we kind of gone through our whole different like our life cycle of what the JVM looks like. We load classes in; they're just interpreted to start with. If they're hot, they go through to being profiled, and then we emit code into the code cache by putting it on the compilation queue. Um, if things go bad, or we don't necessarily know what we're doing, then we can go back into interpreted mode, and this cycle continues. Um, there are there there is there are good reasons why this happens. I mean, um, imagine. Uh, if you imagine using something like Ticketmaster, and you were going on to, I don't know, like book the next Beyonce concert. So you're all going down the code path where you're all trying to book, 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 and all these things come up. And then you know, two days later, you go back and say, actually, how much did I spend on those tickets? If that is the same system, the profile and the way that the application is used would most likely be different. Uh, and the last time I used this example, there was a guy from Ticketmaster in the room, and he said, no, they're two different systems, so you're fine. Um, but that kind of example, it just shows how things are dynamic, and they do change. So the code cache, then, is just, it's, uh, I think I mentioned this before, it's the idea it's jitted on a method-by-method -method basis. Um, and it's all based on when that barometer or that entry count level is exceeded. Uh, it builds an internal representation. Optimizations are, are, are applied, so you effectively have a tree, you look at it, you kind of make all the optimizations that you need, and then you put that into native code. And then what happens is you, you basically twizzle pointers. So what the, the runtime will be doing is it will go, okay, where is that code living? If it's in, um, it's in interpreted, it'll be looking at the, uh, the code uh, segment inside uh, the, class, the class itself. Otherwise, it will swivel that pointer and look at the native code and execute that instead. And that point, those pointers being swizzled is how it's able to 
to change back as well. OK, I have a few minutes to show you JitWatch, which I want to do because all that stuff is, is, is interesting. Um, but just like everything else in the world, there's a magic tool that does this for you. Um, what I would say, just, just as a quick plug to JitWatch, and I think it's a really nice uh, story of open source software and also the London Java community. Uh, JitWatch was built by a guy called Chris Newland because he wanted to understand how the just-in-time compilation stuff worked. So he, he set about a toy project. He built a JavaFX um, application, um, and then he sort of like has been working on it uh, sort of on his own to start with, and then he pushed it to the Adopt Open JDK project. And now I have it on good authority that the Oracle engineers working on the JVM use this tool. So it, it's, it, in terms of what it's doing, it's quite nice. It just takes a log file that's output by Java if you put a series of flags on, and then it parses that log file and gives you this stuff to read where, where it previously, you know, I could be showing you an XML document right now, which you would not like, and I wouldn't like to show you either. Uh, so it's pretty cool. You can just run something inside the sandbox. I apologize, this is really small, but the, the things I want to show you won't be. Um, so the sandbox, here's the Hello World, or if you've got your binoculars out, there's the Hello World. Uh, and you can just run that uh, using this here. And what happens then is once the sandbox has, has finished um, its, its workings, uh, we get something called uh, what they call the try view. And I, I'm just making the window bigger. It's not making the text bigger. Um, so I need to get a presentation mode. Maybe I should put a PR in. Um, so you can see here, if you actually highlight that piece of code, that you can see the bytecode there that was, was generated as a result of uh, print in I, for instance. And that's, that's in this section here uh, for, for this piece. Um, I was actually going to show you that you know, some people do get very excited and say, you know what, can I, can I see the assembly? And, and the answer is, well, yes, you can. So you can just run, a, again, some, some additional flags, and it will show you the assembly that's, uh, that's generated. Ooh. I'm get, I, is my time up? It's getting cut. <laughs> Let's see what's going on. OK, so apparently if you print assembly out to the screen, all, all, all things go wrong. Let me, try, let, me try, pl let me try plug it back in again. You can I, I'm not always being cut. Some, somebody, somebody has, has cut me off. That's Richard's way of saying time's up. That's it. I've, yeah. I've, been, I, I've been garbage collected. <laughs> um, so, cool. So you can see here that you've got like, things like concurrent hash maps and all these other bits that are actually being, uh, th those are the assembly instructions that you would see. Um, if, if you'd set up JitWatch correctly and weren't trying to do this just beforehand, because I, you know the problem with upgrading to Java 10 and all these other nice new things just before you want to use them is that they then don't work when you want to do a presentation. And you're kind of like, anyway, you would normally see the assembly at the right hand side here as well if you'd set up HDIS properly, which is the uh, disassembler, I think. Um, cool, so, so again, that's kind of useful. But what, what if we look at the chain then? So the chain shows me what was done at each different level. So we haven't gone into it in any detail, really, in this talk. But I mentioned that there's this idea of the, the different levels of compilation using C1 and C2. Uh, you can actually go and explore each of those different levels of compilation in the top and see what happened as a result. Um, so we can look here and say, OK, well, Hello World main was compiled. Uh, the print line, there was something unknown in there. That's probably some magic to do with method handles. And then we've got invoke basic all the way down to some of the things that we're actually really doing. Um, which down here you'll see we've got array copy. So array copy being the, the thing that's used to actually do the concatenation low, on the lower levels. Um, you could also see then uh, pieces like of the abstract string builder down in the background that that thing was using. Uh, and the things in green here are saying all this was inlined. So you're actually getting lots and lots of inline chains being pulled together to produce that very um, sort of more efficient code than if you statically compiled it anyway. Um, there are other things that you can do as well. Um, so you can go down one step and actually have a look at things like the code cache, uh, like what's, what's free in terms of the code cache. You can look at the, uh, you can look at all kinds of things. You know what, it will even make suggestions where it thinks that you are doing things in, in a bad way. So you can actually go and look in there and see, like, so not in, in terms of actually like, making decisions on, oh, actually you, could, you, you might be able to do something better here. It'll tell you, like, for instance, if your functions are too long and they couldn't be inlined. So that's JitWatch. You know, again, it's, it's a tool that's worth playing around with, and it makes all of the stuff that we've just looked at 
uh, very accessible. Uh, and in terms of using it, you don't connect it to your Java process. You just output the uh, the, the, f the huge XML document, as it were, and then you can you can parse it. It parses it for you, and you view it that way. I wouldn't say there's zero impact, but I don't think there's significant impact. Okay, so I, I, I'm coming towards the end of my, my slot. Um, so I think, I think in summary then, uh, Java's had this reputation and brand of being slow. It's an unfortunate, um, unfortunate burden that it carries around with it in, in certain sub-communities. Um, but currently, Java's really in a position where some of the instructions that it can execute are comparable to C++ in terms of performance. Um, the pieces where we still fall down um, come in terms of like boxing and unboxing. I know that, that can kind of trip you up, although there are some tools in uh, low-level libraries such as uh, Grona that helps you with that. Um, there's also, like the, the main problem is things like arrays as well. So if you think about arrays, an array of objects is not really an array of objects, it's an array of references, which means every array that you go through, you're going to a pointer and you're indirecting that pointer. That, that breaks locality, breaks kind of like, again, sequential access. So you, that is one of the main performance gaps that we, we would still have if you wanted to be in that world of doing that direct um, C++ comparison. Although you probably shouldn't want to be in that world because one, A, it's very scary, but B, the selection to use Java has taken away a lot of that overhead for you um, in terms of like, having to manually manage memory, knowing about every single thing that's happening. If you think about it, you just write hello world using a for loop and somehow it figures it out and puts it in the right, the right kind of execution for you. Um, Java C doesn't do much optimization. So if you thought that before, um, it doesn't. It's, it's a translator uh, level for effectively what the JIT does all the hard work for you. Um, you. Yeah, we can, so I like this one. You can make better decisions from profiling at runtime. So with static compilation, you just have one shot at making your application really good. Um, at runtime, you've got a lot more information so you can effectively make your application better. Uh, and JitWatch makes life easier, so you don't have to have loads of shell scripts that show you how this stuff works. Now, one word of caution is that you know, you, JitWatch and looking at low-level compilations is not going to usually be where your problem is. Okay, it might be, but there are other things to look at first in terms of performance, which we'll kind of cover. But databases, networks, and IO-bound operations those are usually where the problems are. Um, there's a big, big, big subsystem here, garbage collection. Okay? And then there's the code quality itself. Like Again, think about writing small functions, not 2,000 two line methods or anything like this. OK, cool. I got a question for you. I got a problem. Yeah, and I'm wondering look. if JitWatch can help me solve this problem. So I have this application. And I'm trying to make it run fast, and I'm having trouble because I'm profiling it. Do you want to plug in? Yeah, yeah. So you can bring this up here so you can just take a look at it. Actually, look at the profiler. And uh, maybe you can tell me what's going on because I profiled it, and then I fix what the profiler is telling me to fix. And the application comes up with the same performance at the end. And so it's identical performance. And so. Um, so I c yeah, there we are. So look, OK, so yeah, so for the visually impaired, or even the non-visually impaired, we'll try to do something. As I'd like to say, we'll just make this smaller so we can make it bigger. OK, I wish there we I go. You could have told me that trick earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. I was biting my tongue a few times. OK, um, so, whoa, hello. Are we still on? Yeah, excellent. Okay, that's industrial strength. Okay, so um, so it's telling me this like the score thing is being allocated like gazillions of times and stuff like that. So I went and found it in in the application as to where the problem is and everything like that, and I fixed it, and it you know still performs the same. So I'm wondering you know can JitWatch actually help explain yeah, why so why my optimizations are not working because you know it's getting very frustrating. Right, so, so that's interesting. So you have to remember that Kirk's probably taken the right approach here, well, probably, which is, which is not to go look at the code and try to figure out what's going wrong. You know, that, that is the route to insanity. We know that looking at, your, looking at code and trying to infer what's happening at runtime based on everything we've just shown you is probably not the best idea. 
So the next thing is he's gone through and looks at the profile here and he's seen, seen a score on, on the score. So score, he's, yeah, score. he's got like this uh, score, number yeah. of allocated objects and he's changed the code and he's still seeing that same profile. So the, f the next thing to, to do would be to understand... Well, no, I get a different profile. The score goes away, but the performance doesn't get any better. Right, okay. Oh, okay. I should have shown you that profile too. That's not correct. Sorry. Oh, that's, okay. that's okay. That's okay. So okay. we could go have a look and see what the JIT is doing with that. Yeah, okay. So I, so I'm, so I used the flags because you said use some flags here. And I loaded everything up into uh, JIT watch, but you know, I'm just not good at reading this stuff. So let's see. I'll make it bigger so you can see what's going on here. Everyone see? Awesome. Okay, so what's it saying? Okay, so. What we probably want to have a look for is where that class... Well, we could first have a look at the allocs. So what this will give us is, again, it's going to happen at the different uh, levels of compilation, and it's going to change potentially how an allocation is happening inside oh. your application. Okay. So if we go down to score, if I can see it, shout, oh, shout well, out if you see well, it. Well, it's the fourth line down, I think. I see a score fourth line down. You do? Yeah, right there. Oh, there you go. There, okay. So off, there. off the side of the screen away, there. So easy to just see. Yeah. Okay. So what, what's happened here is um, you can see on the how, well, what, what's happened, it's just been directly allocated. So you're looking at the profile, but what's, what the JIT has already done is it's taken your less than optimal code, Kirk, and optimized it for you. Oh, okay. And so my optimization on top of was not needed because the JIT did it for me. Yeah, it's a dead, cool. dead optimization. Awesome. Okay. So the question is, then why is the profiler not telling me this information? Profilers lie. <laughs> Profilers <laughs> lie? Are you covering something like that? Not all of it. Not all of them do. Not all of them lie. Not all of them lie. Okay, but, but uh, why would this, but I don't understand this, uh, you know, why the profiler would still show this thing as being allocated if it's not being allocated. So I guess it's going to be on the level of visibility that the profiler has. Um, but uh, I'm guessing at this point, so. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's something to do with escape analysis here. You mentioned that. Yeah, so it could be. So in terms of it's working out that the memory that you are allocating, or the memory that you're seeing here that you're trying to remove the allocation for, right. is, I, you know, it could be, it, rather than having to do the allocation um, into the heap, it can effectively move that onto the stack for oh, you. Oh, I see, I, see, I see what happens is, well, this object is, I. This object is small. I looked at it. It's like three integer fields, like two integer fields, one Boolean. So it's the size, you know, it's not, it's not too big. So that would, it's, so it's stack, it can be stack allocated. Kirk, is, is, is the profiler itself defeating the escape analysis? Yeah, I think that might be what's going on here. Maybe because the profiler itself instruments the code and is causing the uh, object that's being allocated to fail escape analysis. Maybe, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Okay. And then... That means the pro profiler is now seeing the allocation because it's happening, and the and the and the runtime can't get rid of it. And uh, so we're providing an optimization here that uh, you know is not needed, but we think we need it because our, our information is incorrect. Then, awesome. Cool. Cool. <laughs> okay. What's that? Oh. Oh, it's, uh, it came apart, right? Okay, so now uh, I don't know if anyone can hear me speaking. Probably you, better. Did you mention the performance? The performance was identical, yeah. It's identical if, you, if I optimize the code or if I don't optimize the code. So it's not just that the, that the profiler is effectively de-optimizing the code? No, it's the profiler is not allowing the code to be optimized uh, because of escape analysis. So it must be the instrumentation. It's very common for memory profilers to actually pass the thing they want to track to another method call. And that's one of the, the, that's one of the conditions that will cause escape analysis to fail, right? Because then this, I think, is the difference between J9 and, and Hotspot, because that, uh, the, the J9 escape analysis is more advanced in the sense that it'll look at it and say, oh, it's only gone off one method, and then nothing happens after that, so therefore it still passes escape analysis, right? Whereas if you just pass it as a parameter or anything else within Hotspot, then it fails escape analysis, and then you're doomed to uh, on-heap um, 
like an on-heap allocation, right? But you're still going to get an on-heap allocation if, you're, uh, if your object is big, big anyways, because you're not going to fill a stack with, uh, with objects. Yeah. I was going to say, it's worth noting as well that um, going back to some of the themes that Jim brought up in his talk, yeah, absolutely. if you had a uh, memory profiler whose instrumentation code had been inlined before the escape analysis run, then it wouldn't necessarily cause the problem either. Of avoiding, of, of causing the method, of the of causing the object to accidentally escape. Of, yeah, of course. Uh, except for the code would be needs to be run, and therefore it would escape yes. uh, before it would actually get compiled. Yeah, unfortunately. Awesome. Cool. Fifteen minutes. Yes. Cool. So before we, we start with the next talk, then we're going to give fifteen minutes. So at twenty past three, we will start straight away. Okay. There should be coffee and biscuits outside as well for the coffee break. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't it? Okay. Uh, so bef before we start, uh, you 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 know if you're in the previous session, uh, we lost uh, we lost a few from the previous session. Oh well, uh, still not back from coffee break, I guess. Okay, um, so you might have noticed that uh, uh, James had a problem with the monitor uh, because uh, Richard um, had a slight uh, mishap with the equipment. I moved my leg. Yeah, he moved his leg, exactly. And, uh, you know, and Sir Richard isn't the first person I know that's actually had this type of problem. Um, I was in Johannesburg uh, speaking with a friend of mine, uh, well, a friend of some of us, we all know, uh, Dr. Heinz Kibbutz. And uh, he was uh, walking across the stage like this just about two minutes before we were supposed to start. And they had this like big power cables up front. And he tripped over the power cable. And just when he did that, the power went out in the entire complex. <laughs> we had no power for anything. So, you know. Was the, was the data center involved? Was the data center involved? Everything. It was just like the whole place gone. I mean, this is Africa, right? So, you know, it's, it's, anyways. Um, it, but it was, in this case, you know, that was causal. But uh, with Heinz, I think it was like uh, uh, serendipity. But it was, uh, it was really kind of fun. Because we always blamed him now for taking out the, it was just like the entire block, right? So we always blamed Heinz for taking out the. Uh, so that could have been Heinz as well. That, that could have been Heinz as well, actually, uh, you know. I, we just don't know what he's doing, but that's okay. Okay, so we weren't talking about power. We we're talking about uh, okay. We're so James was covering off all of this hotspot executing cutable engine stuff, and you know it's all kind of fun. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, garbage collection, but I'm not going to do the normal like uh, uh, basic garbage collection tuning talk. I'm going to try talk a little bit more to what's happening inside G1GC. I, uh, in, in all honesty, uh, you know, um, um, I expect this talk to be absolutely obsolete come September, right? I think it's September. Um, we'll have to look at when the JEP is supposed to do, be out. But um, so, I, I mean, everybody knows about this new uh, release cycle with Java, right? Is everybody, anyone not familiar with the six month cycle thing? Okay, so everybody, I, I assume everybody's familiar. So, in September, Java 11 will come out, and we're going to have a new garbage collectors, and they're going to be bigger, better, faster, and all this wonderful stuff. Um, the, the only objection I have uh, with the JEP, the way it's written, which is the Java, uh, was, what do they call these things? The Java extension proposal? Enhancement. Right. Enhancement, sorry, I always get that wrong. Okay, thank you. The Java enhancement proposal is that uh, they had this paragraph in there, which I really objected to, which is like, um, um, uh, that uh, um, that people were, you know, that garbage collection pause times were responsible for uh, reducing the throughput of your application. And, you know, this is, and, and I just recently read some graduate students wrote a nice paper on work stealing <laughs> stuff, and uh, they said the same thing, that garbage collection was responsible for slowing down the, uh, the throughput of their application because of, the, you know, because of the pauses and stuff like that. And historically, this has never been true. It's never been true. If you go back, does anyone know when the first garbage collector came out? Got a guess? Shout out a guess. 
Give me a guess. I'll give you a free license to some cool uh, GC analysis software. Who's at the beginning of the century? Okay, close. The the beginning beginning of which century? Sorry, nineteenth century. Yeah, okay. Oh, you're smart. That's a long time ago. I think that's even before Ada, right? Ninety six. No, anybody better? Eighty five. Okay, you two come and see me afterwards. Anybody got a better guess? How about 1958 with uh, McCarthy and this presentation? Boom, and you don't need a license. Okay, that's right. 1958. Whoops. Light's still on. Excellent. Uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, it's 1958 MacArthur Lisp engine. Do you know what the GC overhead was? Anybody have an idea? Take a wild guess. Wild guess. Come on. It's 20% in C++, come on. And C++ is fast. You know, it's around 40%. 40% overhead. And they still decided to use a garbage collector in that runtime. You know why? Because the application throughput was better with the garbage collector than without the garbage collector. Right? And so right now, actually, what are we seeing in, in the industry is this assault on the pause time. There's a, there's a war against this GC pause. So everyone's trying to do something to see if they can eliminate the GC pause, um, or minimize it anyway, so minimize the effect of it. And that's, this is a good war to have. It's, re it's really cool, right? Uh, but it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't come without a cost. There's always going to be a cost involved in all this, and the cost is going to be, what is the impact um, that your garbage collector is going to have on the allocators, right? And some, somewhere you have to put this balance between the work you're giving the allocators and the work you're giving the garbage collector. Um, and if you give too much to one side or the other, then what happens is you can make the other guy go faster, but then you take on too much work, which means you go slower. Okay? So really this is, so the battle now they're saying is like, so how can we maintain the application throughput or mutator run rates, right? And try to minimize the effect uh, you know, of the pause time, right? Because well, the pause time, what that represents are tail latencies uh, in your latent, yeah, these are t uh, t tail latencies because the GC events are infrequent. Like you know, if you're running like at several thousand transactions a second and your garbage collector is running, you know, once every, you know, 10, 20 seconds or, you know, longer than that, then really what are you affecting? You're affecting a few transactions that are going to have longer tail latencies than what you would normally like them to have, right? But overall, what we do know is in all the run times, and there's about 75% of the environments that we run applications in historically have been managed run times. But what we know in those particular run times, what we have is that we actually have higher application throughput. We just have this annoying tail latency issue that we have to look after. And hopefully what we're going to see with the new sets of garbage collector com coming out is that we're going to see an attack on the tail latency problem um, without too much of an impact on the allocator throughput problem. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we're hoping for with the G1, actually, right? And really, this is what you get here. It's like, how do you tune the G1 GC? Well, you say I'm using it until you get to JDK 9, where it's the default, and you set a max heap size, and you set this thing called a pause time goal, whatever it is, because, you know, just uh, some suggestion as to what kind of pause time goal you want. I mean, you know, quite honestly, who's not tempted to set that to zero? <laughs> right? Don't do it. <laughs> Trust me, it's not going to work. But anyways, actually, why not? Okay, um, right. So that's how you tune the G G1 GC, right? So, any questions? <laughs> Is my talk short enough now, isn't it right? We can have a Q&A? Awesome. Right. Well, um, the reality of the situation is, and I've tuned about, uh, last year I tuned about 3,000 different JVMs for, for different applications, different domains. And, um, and it just turned out to be a little bit more difficult. 
than just setting these two flags and seeing what was going on. So at, at that point in time, we had to start digging into how does this collector actually work? Uh, what are the knobs that we can basically you know, fiddle with in order to see you know, if we can make this thing run uh, better or not? And um, oh yeah, it's a marketing slide so you can Google if you want more information, but that's it. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's, so that's what we started doing. It's like, okay, let's, let's build some models of these things, right? So whenever I'm looking at problems, one of the things that I find that really helps me a lot is models. And, you know, that, I mean, the good thing about models is it simplifies things so you can understand what's going on. Uh, the bad thing about models um, is, you know, that it ignores complexity. <laughs> and sometimes complexity matters, but, you know. Uh, but for the, most, for, for the most, it really helps. And in this case, what we want to try to do is develop a cost model. Because with the cost model, then we can sort of understand, okay, well, you know, that's, this is where things are going, so, you know, what can we do to reduce that cost, I guess. Okay. So, um, okay, so we're going to develop a cost model. Okay, so what are the things that we get when we get a G1? Well, we get... Uh, you know, we need to talk about a number of things like Java Heap, these things called regions, Mark Sweep, uh, which is our workhorse uh, uh, tracing algorithm, I guess. Um, there's this thing called generational spaces. Um, and I think you addressed the question of generational spaces. So, you know, why do we have them? It's, well, we, we want a nursery uh, because objects have an incredibly high mortality rate when they're, when they're very young. And, and uh, we generally call this the weak generational hypothesis, right? Meaning objects will live for a very, very short period of time, sometimes just a few machine instructions, and, or they're going to live for a very, very long time. And there, we need some other supporting data structures, so it's a, which we'll talk about here. So here's a Java G1 heap, that big black space, we'll say. It's like one contiguous chunk of RAM that's going to be reserved from, uh, from C heap. And then what we're going to do is we're going to divide this thing up into approximately 2,048 regions. The region sizes are going to be fixed, but they're going to be one of either 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, or 32 megabytes in size. And you can see there's some math there that uh, pretends to um, si simulate what's going on in the JVM when it decides what the region size should be and how many regions you should have based on you know, what your max heap setting is. Okay, so we're going to put all the regions into a free list. That's my nice animation. It's very sophisticated, right? Okay, and I'm going to set a pointer up there saying, like, these regions here, those are the ones that I'm going to use for my nursery. That's, that's what I call Eden, okay? So now what I'm going to do is when I start allocating, so I'm going to make my domain object from my new domain object. So I got to do some allocation here, and okay. So, and this is going to be an in heap allocation, not the stack one, because that's he's already covered that. And so what happens is that I'm going to grab it, region, label it as Eden, and then allocate into that space, right? And I'm going to keep doing that until, right, all the regions have been consumed uh, that I've allocated for Eden, and at that point. I'm going to trigger a mark and sweep garbage collection of the young generational regions. I'm going to do this on an allocation failure. So to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is build this thing called a collection set. So I'm going to put all of these regions into the collection set. Right? In order to do that, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to do this mark and sweep, and it's going to be a mix of parallel and serial phases. So you know, first let's put all the regions into the C set. Then I need to calculate a root set for that C set. So a root, a GC root, is a pointer that's known to be live, or, or we're going to presume it's live. And I need to find them. So I need to go searching all over the place, outside of this heap, these, uh, these regions, find the things that are pointing into them, and say, OK, that's my GC root set. And then what I'm going to do is like basically visitor pattern thing, which I'm going to basically trace the references. And everything that I touch, I'm going to mark it as live. And I'm going to do more than mark it as live. What I'm going to do 
is I'm going to copy that data to the two space. Okay, so that's what otherwise known as the survivor space. And then I'm going to place all the Eden regions back on the free list because all the live data has been copied out. And since all the live data has been copied out, these regions are empty, so they can just go back on the list and they can be reused. And then I'm going to recalculate the number of regions to allocate to Eden. So I could make it more or less, depending upon uh, some heuristic engine that's running inside the, uh, inside the JVM. Right, so I end up with something that looks like this. Cool. Now, oops, there's some other parameters down there that I didn't mention, meaning this heap will accordion, you know, will get bigger, smaller, like an accordion, but uh, between these values. And these are values that we sometimes play with in order to make sure that it doesn't get too small or too big, or maybe sometimes to make it, allow it to get bigger. Depends on the situation you're in. Okay. Um, so, um, these slides here, or these pic diagrams here, you can see basically I have the green bar with the yellow bar, right? So that's our Eden regions and our two space. Um, uh, it's drawn this way deliberately because this is actually drawn from data that's, uh, uh, that's been taken from live production systems. So all of the other diagrams you see describing how G1 looks like, they're all lying to you. Every single one. This is what it really looks like. Well, actually, it's worse than this, but I'll show you that later. Okay? So, uh, so I have a little visualization application that takes the data and visualizes it so you can actually see what's going on with this whole thing, right? Uh, okay, so what happens is this is a normal generational garbage collector is what it looks like, even though it's called a regional garbage collector in the sense that I'm going to collect, you know, allocate into Young, into, into, into Eden, and then I'm going to evacuate into the two space and I'm going to evacuate the existing two space into this two space, space so the old two space becomes what's known as the from space. So it goes from from to two. And eventually what happens is I'm going to copy the data from the from space to the two space enough times that I'm going to say, okay, this data is surviving. And because it's surviving, I'm going to hoist it up into tenure space. So it's just going to get copied right up into tenure space. Okay? And that's going to be treated uh, slightly differently. Right, so, you know, here's our young collection again. And really, when you look at this thing here, it's calculation of root set for the C set, we have an issue, and it's a time complexity issue, right? We need to go finding these things like all over the place, which means, uh, if you look at it, right, so that's my C set for a young generational collection down there. my roots are going to be up in the tenured region. Which means if I do a scan for roots in the tenured region, then the scan for root time is going to be linear to the size of tenured space. <laughs> right? And that is a dependency that causes us to fail CMS, or causes our mostly concurrent mark sweep collector that we would use up until JDK 8. Um, you know, basically, you know, that's a property that it had. Scan for root was linear to the size of tenured. So as tenured gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then the scan for root times gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it starts dominating the pause time. So we'd like to do something to break this dependency between scan having this need to scan for roots in tenured space and the size of the tenured space. So to do that, um, they're going to introduce this thing called a remembered set. Now, a remembered set is basically... Do I have a picture of that? Yeah, I don't. Sorry, should have put one in. Okay, so re what a remembered set is, it's a, it's, it's a pointer tracking system. It's an accounting system. So if I have foo and tenured pointing to bar and young, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have for that region in young, I'm going to have a remembered set for that uh, region in tenured, and I'm going to record that pointer value in the remembered set. Okay? And so when I do the scan for roots, I don't have to go linearly through tenured space. I'm just going to look into the remembered sets, and that's going to give me my root set for the young generational collection. Okay. So that might, should leave some questions in your mind that you won't have time here to actually think about, but you'll walk out and you'll think, like, wait a minute. 
what happens if I have foo pointing to bar, and all of a sudden I have like foo pointing to some other bar, and then foo pointing to foo, fa, and, and all of a sudden it's not just allocation rates that become an issue, it's also pointer mutation rates that become an issue with these collectors. Since we're tracking pointers, the rate at which we mutate them actually uh, will affect the amount of work that the garbage collector has to do. Right? And it also means that as I mutate these things, I need to do some bookkeeping to keep the R sets up, uh, you know, uh, in sync with reality. And, and so that's a problem because updating the remembered sets is actually quite expensive. Um, you know, we just can't have like a straight card table system, like an array type thing, because then we're going to tra trade this time complexity issue into a space complexity issue, right? Because if I have, you know, basically um, a region in Young, and I have one remembered set for each region in tenured, well, you know, then you basically it's n times, you know, n, n to the m or whatever, you know, that, that type of math at play. So you can see that's a real issue. Um, so what they did is they said, okay, well, you know, let's not have the mutator threads actually updating these things because they're expensive to update and there's all kinds of other issues. Um, so what, instead what we're going to do is we're going to just have the mutator threads put the fact that I changed the pointer value into this thing called an R set refinement queue. And I'm actually going to have now R set refinement threads potentially running in the background that are going to drain this queue. And you see it's a zonal queue, and there's sizes here that can be configured. And you can see that as it gets more full, um, the R set refinement threads are going to get more aggressive in trying to clean it out. And uh, when it gets to a certain level of fullness, then it's going to say, you know what? You're just going, you're mutating too fast. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, you, you have to do your own updates. So the mutator threads are going to be responsible uh, for updating the R set refinement thread. Now, the idea here is that the garbage collector, before it can run, has to see this queue completely empty. So when the garbage collector runs, the first thing it's going to do is drain this thing. And we don't want the draining to actually cost more than 10% of the pause time goal. OK? So that's, this is where the numbers start coming into play here. Um, so this is good. So that's basically how Young works, right? So everything in Young goes into the C set. We're going to do mark, sweep, and things that reach this magical age called a tenuring threshold are going to be pushed up into tenure space. So the next question is like, well, what happens in tenured? Well, tenured is, is treated differently in the sense that we're just going to allow it to grow until it consumes a certain percentage of heat. And that percentage has uh, been bouncing around in terms of what the value should be, but I think it's currently at 45%. So that means that uh, when our heat is 45% consumed by tenure space, we're going to trigger what's known as a concurrent mark of tenured, OK? And all we're going to do in the concurrent mark of tenured is we're going to calculate the liveliness of the, uh, the percent live in terms of the data in each of the regions. And that, that'll be an important value for the rest of the algorithm. So we're going to start here with a stop the world phase, where we're going to capture a, this is what the world looks like now. We're going to piggyback that on uh, a young generational collection. So that's known as an init initial mark. So it's a, like a scan for root event. Afterwards, um, we're going to go through these concurrent phases. Finally, we'll do a remark. So to try to capture the difference between what happened here and what happened here, because during the concurrent phases, obviously, the world is changing. And so we need to try it. So you know, the remark is to try to account for that change. We're also going to do reference processing in here. And then we can start doing some cleanup afterwards, which, which means uh, if we can release memory back uh, to the system. Now, that means we have to look at how the C sets are built, right? Because, OK, remember, this is a mark. It's not a sweep. So how do these things get swept? Well, it's actually the young generational collector that's going to sweep them, which means that 
we now are not only going to put young genera generational regions into the CSET, but we're going to put tenured regions into the CSET also, and that's known as a mixed uh, collection. Okay, so imagine here's a set of regions, and the green bits is how much is live, and the black bits is like how much is uh, not live after a mark. And first thing I need to do is more animation, yeah, uh, is I'm going to sort them uh, by percent liveliness. Those are free, those are empty. They can go back onto the free list immediately. Um, and then we have this G1 mix, GC live, threshold percentage, 85%. That means that anything that is more than 85% filled with live data, I'm not going to bother trying to do a mark. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to bother sweeping that, right? Because if you look at the sweep cost, that's basically copying all the data out, you know? Of course, that's going to be a function of percent liveliness. If, it's, if you have a region that's very live, then it's going to be very costly because we have a lot of data to copy out. As you can see, the empty ones are free. Yes? Where do you get these statistics from? So the green bar is that's, 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 this is part of the concurrent mark. So, so what we've done is we've gone through the mark phase. The mark phase is responsible for basically coloring the, the green as it is here. That's the, the purpose of the mark is to calculate the statistic. Well, it does other things, but that's you know, what it's going to do. Okay? And after it's calculated that statistic, um, then you know, we can sort by it. We can sort the regions by that, okay? And then basically we're gonna set up, get, end up with a set of regions which are eligible to be collected, okay? And we need to collect these within eight mixed collection cycles. So that's how it's gonna be set up. And we're gonna use the time budget again. So the ergonomics and running inside uh, the uh, garbage collector are going to estimate how long it takes to collect each of these regions they're going to estimate how long it's going to take to collect the young generational regions, and then it's going to just keep adding regions to the collection set until it's used up the time budget. And then it will stop, and then we'll leave the rest for the next mix collection. Now, there's some conditions under, under, which, under which it will abort that attempt. If it finds that it can't get more than 10% of heat back, um, then it will abort the entire process and it'll just say, okay, let's just, do, we'll, we'll get it next time. Okay. One last point here, and then we can have some fun. Okay. The last point is, um, say we have a one meg region size and we go to allocate a, an array that's, I don't know, like uh, two megs in size. How does that work? Right? Well, they manage that uh, by calling, well, first this is going to be called a humongous allocation. And uh, what a humongous allocation is any allocation that's bigger than half the size of a region. And so what they're going to do in this case is they're going to find enough contiguous regions to satisfy the allocation, and then they're going to allocate into that, in, into, into those regions. Ugh. Sorry, that was a bit awkward, but... <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you can see that here, right? So, um, like, take this one, for instance, right? So here we have one, two, three regions. So we have a, continue, a, a humongous start and then two humongous continuation regions for that particular uh, allocation. And you can see we got lucky. We could find a hole in heap here that was actually big enough to satisfy it. If you can't find a hole big enough in heap to satisfy it and you get an allocation failure with this, you get a full GC. Single thread it up until... Java 10, parallel in Java 10, but I don't think you're going to care that they've parallelized it. <laughs> okay? The fact that it's running in parallel sounds like really, really good until you've experienced your first full GC. Then you're going to go like, okay, we don't want this to happen again. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and, and you can see that what's happened here is that, okay, well, we have these really big humongous allocations here. So this is, again, it's from a live production data, uh, uh, a JVM running live in production. 
And, and, you can, and you can see some other characteristics up there. So there's some humongous allocations at the top of heap, right? And, and with a little bit of thinking about the whole thing, uh, you know, reasoning through it, you can, you can sort of figure out what's going on here, right? So, I mean, this comes out of a cluster of uh, 1,500 JVMs. So you can probably guess what the humongous allocations are at the top. Anybody have an idea? Did I, did I hear someone say cash? Excellent. Yeah, you said cash. Excellent. Oh, no, okay. I heard cash. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's a cash. Probably, right? And you think of the caching patterns, right? You build a cache, you fill it up, and there's stuff you need for the runtime, so it just stays there, right? And so that's what that looks like. What about the things at the bottom? Right? Now, it's like, turn your brain off a of tuning crap. Let's go to application development mode where I got, like, JVMs and they're talking to each other and you know stuff is happening and anybody want that? Got a guess? Got a guess? Almost. Sockets are buffered in C heap. So that's native memory, native memory tracking. Almost. One more guess? Come to this side. It's our favorite, favorite thing to be doing. Everybody's doing it. Jason. Oh, did I hear Jason? Excellent. Well done. These are like Jason serialization buffers, right? And you can see this is really, uh, there's a lot of Jason serialization buffers happening here. And it was actually causing a lot of grief to the G1 collector. So, we, you know, this, this was actually helpful in helping us to understand what was actually going on. And um, so, yeah, we talked about that. So, uh, you know, so, so generally what happens is that the JVM tries to reserve a space here, okay? And the reserve space here is just to, you know, those moments when it's like, oh my God, I got a huge JSON serialization going on here and no contiguous space to allocate it. I better dip into reserve. Otherwise, I'm going to have to have a full GC. Okay? Cool. Yeah, what about this baby? Okay? Uh, this is cool. This is, this is actually an FX application. I'm very proud of this part because we're actually able to use uh, CSS shading in order to uh, represent the uh, occup live occupancy percent in each of the regions. So the dark blue is live and the light blue is not live for the tenured regions. Yeah? Oh, no, the, this is, these, these regions here are tenured, right? The green regions are Eden, the yellow regions are Survivor, the reds are humongous, okay? And, and so, they, they're out, so from the free list, they're allocating, um, there's a bunch of allocation strategies. If you look at uh, the newer um, uh, collectors coming up, the allocation strategies get even more uh, exotic. Uh, but in this case, right, the allocation strategy is that um, you know, mutators allocate their uh, garbage collection threads allocate in, uh, like, in that direction, right? So, you know, so, I mean, you think about it, right? It's like the, if you're doing a mark sweep, the sweep is actually a copy. Who's doing that? It's the garbage collection threads. So the garbage collection threads are the, pretty much the threads responsible for uh, creating the tenured regions. Awesome. Okay. So... Yeah, so what do you think of this mess here? This is kind of fun, right? <laughs> you can see that whatever happened, this event happened really nicely because it just basically consumed. Um, this, this is actually a very degenerative case in the sense that the tenured spaces have consumed almost the entirety of heap, and um, it's caused some other um, bits of grief that uh, eventually just resulted in, a, in, a, in the JVM uh, wanting to full GC this. And you, and you can see, at this point in time, it's, you know, the uh, tenure just squished out young quite considerably. And, and since the humongous regions are, are never moved around, then, you know, that creates other issues and stuff like that in terms of how you, uh, what the allocation schemes look like within the collector. Uh, but, yeah, this is, this is an issue, as you can see. Um, cool. 
How do we get a GC log? Uh, well, this is up to, until uh, JDK 9. Um, actually, I should put the flags in this talk about how you get logs now with the unified logging. Um, so everybody probably knows that in JDK 9, the JVM guys decided that Log4j was so freaking great that we should just replicate that massive performance bug that we have in our application code right down inside to the JVM. <laughs> and that's what they did. Way to go. <laughs> okay. So is it, you guys use log4j and everything like that? Okay. So I'll give you a hint here. So every time we go to a place and we say, why don't you try stripping out all your logging statements? we typically see minimally a 4x improvement in application throughput, right? So, um, James, I'm sorry to say that when you say that the database is the problem, you're wrong. Um, the m biggest uh, performance problem I typically run into is going to be allocation rates. And the vast percentage of those allocation rates are driven by actually logging. Um, log4j, logback, SLF4j, JDK logging, you name it, doesn't matter, they're all crap. So, so okay. Anyways, um, so, uh, and, and you're, you're going to see this actually with JDK 9 logging. It's in our benches, we got a 60% uh, hit on throughput on one of our benches uh, from turning on all the logging uh, that you can turn on. Uh, generally with uh, JDK 8, this type of logging, uh, the throughput hit is not noticeable. And I would suggest that if you go light, on JDK 9 logging that the, the throughput hit shouldn't be too noticeable. Um, but we warned them. They decided to go and do it anyways. Okay. Um, right. So when you get a GC log, um, you know, we need to go look at them. Who likes looking at log files? <laughs> Seriously? Okay. I have a really good therapist for you guys, so. That's all I can say. Uh, yeah, reading log files. Yeah, um, let's just get some tooling to do it, right? So I, you know, if I'm tuning all these JVMs, of course, you can guess that I got some tooling to help me manage all of that. And we have wonderful Sensum. Actually, Richard, your fingerprints are still all over this. So. Excellent. Excellent, yeah. Right? I just couldn't figure out how to get rid of them because, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's look at one of the GC logs. And if you look at the GC logs, you, um, I mean, I didn't tell you too much about the internals that are going on and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but when you actually start looking at the tooling, you can see what's going on. Um, so for our tooling, uh, first off, we don't like um, uh, reading logs. And if there's things we can do to actually get the log, uh, the tooling to tell us what's going on, then we'll do that. Like here it's complaining about high kernel times in this case. Uh, um, uh, this is an interesting analytic in the sense that um, we see all kinds of occasions where people will say, I got really long GC log pause times. And they'll say, okay, send me a GC log. And you look at the GC log and you say, nope, you don't have any problem with GC pause times. But you really need to tune your operating system or you're, you're running too many virtual machines on the box or you know, you're under-provisioned in some particular way um, that's occurring outside of the JVM, right? Not internal to the JVM, actually. Sometimes it could be internal to the JVM. Depends on what's going on. But, um, but um, most of the times, the vast majority of the times, it's something outside the JVM. It, it's, it's, what we're doing here is we're saying, like, okay, so if you have a misconfigured um, operating system or an overloaded operating system or whatever like that, then basically you have an equal opportunity performance killer and the garbage collection logs just happen to have the data to let you know what's going on, right? Um, and so you can, you can look at things. I, there's things like kernel times exceed at user times 10 times in log files. Okay, so this number's not big. I don't really care about that so much. But you, th you start thinking about it. Okay, garbage collection thread, where does it run? User space. Why is a garbage collector thread collecting kernel time? You know, you can start asking yourself something. Uh, um, we see this all the time, right? There's a gap between real time, real time and CPU utilization, right? So we're basically saying we got two seconds of CPU time, but it took 10 seconds for the GC to run. I'm like, huh? I got, eight, I got an eight second gap in that calculation where the garbage collector wasn't running. 
because something was interfering with it, right? So, so you can look at these logs and you can start answering not only just interesting questions about what's going on uh, garbage collection wise, but actually what's going on in the system and get an overall sense of what's happening health wise in your application. And, and you can start looking at the data in, and see what's going on. So, you know, other things we look at, we look at allocation rates. Oops, here we go, allocation rates. Huh? Um, so generally this thing is allocating probably, yeah, you know, you can bounce around and do an eyeball average you know, somewhere, say, around the gigabyte. I'll, you know, I'll be generous here. I'll say it's about one gigabyte per second or something as, as an allocation rate. And what we generally find is that um, you look at uh, tuning an application, um, you're on a power curve, right, in terms of allocation rates. And um, there's two needs that are kind of important. One of them is one gig and one is 500 megabytes or 300 megabytes in, that, in about that range, right? So th it's between three and 500, um, you're on the flat part. Um, you know, you're just leaving the, the knee going to the flat part. And around the gig, you're just coming off of the steep part where you're just starting to curl out. Um, so those are two magic numbers. And it doesn't, guess what? It doesn't matter which hardware you're running on, right? These are, these are magic numbers that seem to be platform independent. So it's the same on a laptop as it is on a Raspberry Pi as it is on a server class machine. Um, and, and, you, and you have to, okay, well, so why is that? Okay, well think about how Java typically allocates memory. We typically allocate memory, you know, a few, you know, hundreds of bytes at a time, right? So if you're allocating two gigs a second, a hundred bytes at a time, what do you think you have? You get a frequency problem, right? And that's, that's where the expense is. So if you get the allocation rates down, then of course you're reducing the frequency at which you're allocating uh, memory, and of course you get some really nice performance gains uh, when you start doing that. And unfortunately, this is, a, this is something that's mostly completely invisible to people because people don't measure what their allocation rates are. And because they don't measure what their allocation rates are, they get this huge bias by their tooling as to what they think the actual performance problems are. Now, and, and I'll give you a difference here. Uh, you know, like if you think like, okay, I do some work and I get like a 10% gain in my performance, right? I'm doing really good, right? You know, to me, a 10% performance gain means that you've missed the real bottleneck. So, um, so if you look at like, I don't know, uh, theory of constraints. Theory of constraints says there's one bottleneck in your system that's going to control the throughput and, the, and, control, and therefore control the latencies and things like that, right? And um, if you tune before the bottleneck, things are going to get worse. If you tune after the bottleneck, that's an illusion of performance improvement. That's your 10%. But if you hit the bottleneck, that's where you're going to get the big gains, right? Uh, and you know, in, in some things, in one extreme case, when we hit the bottleneck like this, we went from like 400,000 TPS to 25 million TPS. That's a gain from hitting the bottleneck, okay? And that, that was basically done in one measurement, and that's like an allocation rate measurement. So it went, for, it went from 1.8 gigs per second uh, close to, uh, you know, uh, 100. 100K or something like that. So just bringing, bringing the allocation rates down, okay? Because that was the bottleneck in the system. All of the other tools were showing different things. Okay. Um, yeah, and, then, and, then, and you're gonna get, you, you'll see some nice, uh, nice reports uh, from people um, saying, yeah, the database is the problem or these things are the problem. Uh, that, you know, like, uh, I don't know, what's the other thing? There's a whole list of you know, typical people. But the, a lot of these things that people are reporting on is because that's what you have instrumented, because that's what you're used to looking for, so that's what, and they're easy and you can find them. Right, so if you start getting measurements uh, without bias in them, uh, then you can find the real bottlenecks, and then you, know, you, you can make some really significant uh, changes in your application performance. Okay, so um, let's look at phase time. So I'm gonna do this trick since I know you guys in the back can't see this at all because it's so small. And boom, okay. There, um, so in this case here, you can see uh, what we're seeing is that the, there's a mix of the 
parallel phases and the other serial phases here. And of course, we want the parallel phases to dominate in all of this. Here, let me just make it a bit smaller because um, when, they when the parallel phase dominates, that means we're getting into this condition where, and here's the parallel phases um, as a percent. You can see that when the parallel phases dominate, uh, what's going to happen is that the object copy costs are going to dominate uh, the, uh, you know, the, your late, well, your pause time budget here, okay? And that's exactly what we want with the G1. You want the object copy cost to completely dominate uh, the, the picture. So here you can see this is pretty shitty distribution. I want this red stuff, which is the object copy time, to basically be way up there. So this is poorly tuned at this point, okay? And you can see other stuff happening down in here that's actually uh, update remembered set. That's these blue things. Um, and there's code root scanning, external root scanning. So that's your scan for root times and stuff like that. Um, and there's a problem with termination here. So there is, um, so there's work stealing involved in here, which is multiple threads trying to steal from each other. And they do seem to have some trouble terminating. And that might be a, an effect from the operating system itself, not letting things um, uh, complete properly. Um, if we look at the other phases, you can see there's clear dominance in here as to what's going on. And the clear dominance in this case is going to be from reference processing. Now, by default, reference processing is done serially. Okay? And you can turn it on so it can parallel reference process. Now, why is parallel reference processing not turned on by default? Well, it's because of the benchmarks that Oracle uses. They've been written in the 19th century or 18th century uh, for applications that were that, you know, that size. And, and today, um, I think a typical application, we see that they're much, much bigger. But since the benchmarks give better numbers with serial than with parallel, then, of course, serial is on by default. Okay. So we typically see, uh, you know, the, in this case here, it's very clear what's happening is that we want to make sure that parallel reference processing is actually turned on here so that we can reduce this. So in this case, it'll move it all the way down into the floor. So it'll completely balance things out for you. So there's, anyways, you can see, once you can start seeing what's going on, then you can start making some uh, reasonable decisions as to, as to what's happening. This is our CPU summary. Now this, I mean, this is the, basically the, oops, sorry, <laughs> poster child for analytics, right? Can anyone here see where the problematic CPU utilization points are? Yeah, I didn't think so. Neither can I. Uh, so, I mean, we can look at this chart. It's quite nice, but quite frankly, it's the analytics that are going to give you, well, you can sort of see, like, okay, here's some system times, like, way up there. And you've got to wonder, okay, what happened to the operating system at that point in time? Are we done? Just about. Anyways, um, so there's just like a basic little tour. There's some other stuff in here that we could talk about. I think in the interest of time, I will uh, leave it out and just go back to one more topic. And the last topic I'll do here is uh, what I call um, the weak generational hypothesis, right? So the, the, so the curve that you get from the weak generational hypothesis looks approximately like this. So every application... Well, mo I should not it in. Most applications will have a curve that looks like this, okay? Um, now, um, here's the fun part, right? If we have a curve, what can we do to it? Well, we can do calculations with it, right? Like uh, area under the curve. So we, what's the area under the curve here? What's well, the volume? That's my live data set size. So that's the amount of data that's constantly live in my heap, okay? Now, if you look at the cost model for the G1, the cost model for the G1 is uh, dominated by object copy costs, right? We just we said that. Excellent. So that means that the cost of a collection in our VM should be constant. So our pause time should be constant for some variable definition of constant. <laughs> okay? And I say variable because obviously you know, we get some fluctuations in the size of the live data set size over time. But over, over the long haul, it, it should be here. If it's not here, um, we would tend to call that a memory leak or some other condition, right? Okay, so if we have our heap set up so that we fill, 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 and we collect 
when we hit this level and we come back down to something that looks like this and we fill and collect and fill and collect like that, right? Um, we're doing GC at a certain frequency. The frequency is going to be controlled by the allocation rate, yeah? Okay. Now, the question is, how do you reduce object copy costs? If object copy costs are what dominates, then that's going to be my direct bottleneck. I need to go after it. That's what theory of constraints tells me. Okay? So what do I do? Well, there's nothing I can do about object copy costs. Nothing. Except slow the collector down. Okay? And this is where you get into some common misconceptions about, about the whole thing. So what happens is that um, what I can do is just make the heap bigger. Now, the heap bigger isn't going to have any effect on the live data set size. It's going to remain the same. Therefore, the cost of the collection should remain the same as long as I have no linear dependencies in my collector on the size of the heap. And we can do that with G1, actually. What we can do is we can just make the heap bigger. We assume the same allocation rate. That means the frequency of collection goes down, which means the per collection cost will remain the same, but uh, through the lifetime of the application, the overall cost will be much reduced. Okay, and that's really one of the strategies that we've used uh, to help reduce the overall impact of the collector on application performance. And I think we're done. Question in the back, yes. No, 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 no. That's 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 the that's the fallacy, right? The fallacy is that if I have more data, dead data in, in heap, then it's going to cost more to collect because I have more stuff to go through, right? But the fault is caused by the collection being longer, right? No. No, the weak, the, you know, the charting and stuff. The explanation I said says no. The, it's it it is it, it's. The, it's a function of the live data set size, okay? And the live data set size should remain constant. You know, it's going to fluctuate, but it remains constant over time. And that's why you get fluctuations in the pause time. Well, one of the reasons why. Um, because, you know, at any one point in time, it's slightly different. But overall, it should be fairly, uh, f a fairly regular pause time. And in a well-tuned G1, G1, that's exactly what you see. You're going to see a cluster of pause times that you know, they're just going to form a flat line on the, in the pause time chart. But yeah, that's an excellent question because this is a, um, a you know, people will look at garbage collection and say, well, I got more garbage, so it's going to take more time to collect it. And really think of it this way, right? This is where words sort of matter. Um, call it, don't call it garbage collection, call it live object harvesting. <laughs> right? And if you think of it that way, and think of a cost model using those words. Uh, it'll, it's sort of, you know, it's like a cognitive shift. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, about the uh, log, uh, I mean, removing the log will uh, improve the performance, correct? Uh, the log for J? Yeah. Like oh, hell yeah, just get rid of it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you don't need it anyways. Who, uh, who reads log for J logs anyways? I never do. I mean, in, in every, any problem I've gone into, at the end of it, you say, well, how much did your logging help, help us? And they'll go like, eh, okay, it didn't. We're done. Yes? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the G1 cleanup phase. Um, Sorry, so I... What caused G1 cleanup to be long? Uh... That's a very good question. Um, there shouldn't really be anything in there that's causing it to take a long time unless there is just a large amount of uh, data that it actually has to go through. So some of the, there's some data structures that will, that it actually has, there's certain things that can't happen while the collector is running, so that information gets queued, okay? And at the end of the collection, then the thing you want to do is like start draining those, those queues. So I, I, so I mean, things that cause the collector to run for a particularly long period of time would be uh, high mutation rates during the concurrent cycle, because that would tend to cause the remark to run longer, because you're going to have a dirtier heap, right, so that, that you have to reconcile against from the initial mark. Um, 
how that would trickle out into the cleanup phase, um, I can't. Is, is this a problem that you're having now? I, I would really be interested to uh, to, to see that because we've we've been tracing down a couple of bugs in the collector, and so the cleanup one is one that um, shall we say has escaped my attention. So I, um, but I. I can't say that I've actually seen long cleanup phases myself, so, but we've seen other issues that result in full GCs that are degenerative. And I think it has to deal with how uh, weak references are maintained in collections and how they're marked, or uh, better yet, how they're not marked. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have to stop. Yeah, we're done. Sorry, time's up. I just got the, I'm dead. Thanks, guys. Another 15 minute break, and then, yep. and then, uh, then you get to hear Richard's. Excellent uh, talk on profilers lying to you. Okay? <laughs> Cheers. Okay, afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Good, good. Afternoon, excellent, excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much to Kirk and Jim for giving their uh, excellent talks for or parts of this, this, this session so far. Um, Jim talking about how you can't really have a completely static view of JVM code. Um, you need to have a look at the runtime behavior. And Kirk talking about how you need to look at the, the runtime behavior in terms of garbage collection as well. So we're going to continue that theme on by looking at the profiling side of things and why it's a really good idea to profile in production, how you can actually do this in practice in 2018. Uh, so my name's Richard. Uh, my name's Sadiq. Uh, and between us, uh, we run a little startup called Opsian that does some tools for production profiling. But don't worry, this is not like a, we've locked the doors and got you into a one-hour product pitch. It's OK. There's like a, a lot of general ideas and concepts that you can take back regardless of what tooling or approaches you use. Cool. So what are we actually going to be talking about for the, the final hour of this session? Firstly, why performance matters. I mean, it's really interesting to hear about some of these low-level technical details and intricacies, but we're actually going to be talking about it more from a business side of view, why it should actually matter to your organization, why you should allocate time to solving these kind of problems. And then we look at the difference between development and production environments as a more general kind of concept, why you can't just tune things in development so easily, why you want to look at production. Uh, we're going to have a look at the distinction between profiling and other forms of monitoring and where it sits into, say, the bigger APM space. I want you to talk specifically about production profiling and different methods for implementing profilers in Java as well. Fantastic. So why does performance matter? Um, and I think the first thing here is uh, customer experience, right? So the first thing to think about is how happy are your customers? Everyone wants happy customers. Everyone wants people who are enjoying using the software that they're spending a lot of our time on as professional developers. And performance is a really big part of that customer experience. If you have really, really slow software that's frustrating to use, it can be a real problem. It can lead to a really poor customer experience. Another thing to think about is stopping costly downtime. Now, who in this room, put your hands up, if you use Friendster to talk to your colleagues, family members, and friends? That's no one, right? Why does no one use Friendster to talk to people these days? I, mean, I, I remember the frustrating experience with Friendster many, many years ago, and you would just spend ages watching the browser do its little spinny thing. I remember this at university. Uh, Friendster, um, classically, we were originally going to use the Twitter fail whale, but then we thought actually using the fail whale is a bad example because they're all billionaires now. Uh, so uh, we thought Friendster was a great example, somebody that, you know, an organization that pretty much everybody has forgotten because they were unable to scale, basically. Absolutely. They end up having downtime due to performance problems. Performance problems aren't the only cause of downtime with your system, but they can be a common cause of downtime, especially at periods of kind of peak traffic and high throughput. Yeah, it's, it's worth pointing out as well that unaddressed performance problems do become incidents when you're scaling. So something that might, you might be just be able to cope with during kind of your standard kind of uh, trough load will actually become an incident if it's unaddressed and you do then scale your system up. So that, that is something to be aware of. Absolutely. The other thing to think about is responsive applications actually end up making more money. Latency, when you talk to people in London, 
they often think of high frequency trading, low latency applications, the really kind of sexy end of the latency reduction space. But actually, even a lot of consumer facing websites have similar kind of problems. So both Amazon and Google published A B studies that they have done on uh, their production systems, evaluating what the impact was on their revenue. So Amazon uh, published a study saying that 100 milliseconds of added latency on their Amazon.com website cost 1% of sales. But that's just 1%, sounds like a small number, but only 100 milliseconds of added latency on the page. That's almost, it, actually, if you ask people how fast that is, they'll probably have difficulty measuring it. But you can still see when you look at the revenue numbers that it drops down. Uh, Google added a 500 millisecond uh, delay on their search page load time, and they found that traffic dropped 20%. So half a second slowdown on their search page load time caused 20% of users to just browse away or go elsewhere. We're really, really impatient, right? That's, that's the truth. We're measurably impatient. And, and there, are, there are quite a few industries. I used to work in ad tech, and obviously... We're not quite in the HFT area, but uh, if anybody's worked in ad tech, uh, there's a lot of situations where you need to be able to respond to a request for, say, a real-time bid within a certain window. Say you have 120 milliseconds past network latency. If you make it within that 120 milliseconds, you make money. If you miss that, you don't. You make nothing. And if you miss enough of them, the exchange cuts you off. So for some industries, there's this very, very tight kind of requirements around this. Absolutely. Then there's developer productivity. The lovely people at Zero Turnaround, who do a huge amount of surveys and publish their results, did this one on developer productivity. And they found that the average developer, whatever the average developer is, uh, spent two hours a week firefighting their production environment. Now, I joke about what is an de average developer. There is no real average developer. And what that means in practice is you'll probably have no firefighting for a while and then a week of complete chaos. I mean, can you imagine being woken up at 3 a.m. every morning with your system being out, Sadiq? He's smiling because I have a six-month-old son, so uh, I, I struggle to remember what sleep is actually like. Um, being woken up once at 3 a.m. Would, would be a good thing. That's every hour, basically. <laughs> Developers cost a lot of money. Having developers or having your team firefight production problems is a very expensive use of their time. Trying to avoid having a huge amount of time spent doing this kind of things is, is, a, is a real win. And then there's reducing infrastructure costs. Now, for many companies, infrastructure costs are only a small fraction of, say, their development cost. So when I say infrastructure costs, I mean the actual cost of running hardware in data centers or on the cloud, things like that. But if you scale up, that can be a real problem. And the other aspect of this reducing cost, which we'll mention a little bit later, is the fact that a lot of people these days deploy to a cloud-based environment, right? So who uses something like AWS, Azure, GCP, something like that? Don't be shy. Hold your hands up. It's OK. It's OK. Loads of people do it, right? Those are all environments where you're being billed by the resources that you consume in terms of that infrastructure. So inefficient, inefficient software can cost money straight out and very directly there. OK? Cool. But people might have a performance problem, or they might want to improve their performance for a variety of those different business reasons. And they might initially seek to try and identify the cause of that performance problem in a developer environment. Right, Sadiq? Yes. Right. So we, I'm going to be talking about why development isn't production. Uh, for one, a lot of people do their performance testing in development. Why? Because it's generally just a lot easier, right? A lot of the, the tooling that we have for performance, like the desktop profilers and such like, they're all based around uh, d d they're all based around working on your local environment, right? The uh, the problem with this is that testing, or performance testing at least, in your development environment is not representative of production. And over the next few slides, we're going to go into some of the reasons why that's actually the case. So first thing uh, is unrepresentative hardware. Uh, so if you're, if you're uh, a developer, you are most likely uh, working on a laptop uh, or, a, or a desktop. Uh, that is unlikely to be representative of the, the production environment that you're currently running on. 
right? There is a whole bunch of differences. Uh, it started with the CPU. You probably got uh, a much higher frequency CPU. Uh, it's got a smaller power envelope, different number of cores, maybe even different processor features. But Sadiq, surely if I'm doing some performance testing on like a nice new shiny Dell laptop, and I'm deploying to some massive beast in production, if it works on my thin little laptop, it's going to be fine on that big production system, right? It's going to be the same kind of problem. So if I fix them here, I'll fix them there. Well, you think so, but there, there, are, some, there are some kind of subtleties involved here. So if uh, you have a, say, beefy 32-core uh, server processor, uh, you might hit completely different lock contention issues than you do on a, on a dual-core laptop, for example. So wh while it may be more powerful in aggregate, uh, you may actually hit completely different problems. And, and we'll see this in other things as well. So uh, it might be that your production environment is using enterprise-grade SSDs, you know, much lower latency, higher throughput, whereas your laptop is using a, a client uh, SSD. And so you, what you'll see is you'll see a shift of, bottle, of the bottlenecks away from I.O. into CPU on your servers that you won't see on your desktop environment. The next thing is unrepresentative software. So how many people here run exactly the same software on their laptop as they do on their production servers? We had we one guy put his hand up once. That was fun. Uh, rip his battery life. Um, so, uh, and I've worked in many organizations recently where, oh, there's Kirk at the back putting his hand up. Uh, <laughs> So I've, wor I've worked in uh, uh, quite a few organizations recently, actually, where, where uh, development actually happens uh, on a completely different operating system to production, where you know, development maybe happens on Macs and production is, is on a Linux system. But even assuming you're running the same operating system, different versions of software, uh, different versions of the kernel and, and libc, for example, can have very different performance. And we actually saw that uh, over the last year, where um, the mitigations required for Meltdown and Spectre actually change Cisco performance depending on what kind of kernel you're on in, in, in different, completely different ways. So my, my development on my laptop is a Windows 10 install. And Windows 10 had an update released last week that actually slowed down uh, UDP throughput by 40%. Right? That's crazy. That's just in one-off update. I'm not even sure what the cause of that was. But that's a crazy slowdown in throughput. Yeah. And then, of course, the biggest, biggest thing is the JVM. Uh, the, uh, the JVM, you want to be running the same JVM as you do in production, and that's not always the case. And while we come to expect that upgrading the JVM leads to a free uh, win in performance, that's not always the case. I know one uh, organization had an application that was being deployed. It's totally great under Java 7. Uh, when they upgraded to Java 8, the switch to using tiered compilation by default rather than server mode compilation actually ended up causing a 10x slowdown in a very computationally expensive part of their application. It wasn't necessarily a whole Java 8 big picture problem. They could just enable that flag and get the performance back they had before. But you need to be aware of that kind of difference in version and that potential regression that you might have when you think things are going to be better. And then the next one is, is uh, uh, virtualized environments. Uh, so again, you are, you are probably running your, your production systems using some kind of virtualization. Uh, Package Cloud uh, did a very interesting report uh, a couple of years ago. Oh, actually, no, last year. Uh, it's been a long six months. Uh, and they uh, discovered that the certain very frequently used Linux timing syscalls actually took significantly longer on certain versions of the Zen hypervisor that were being used on EC2. So unless you're able to actually uh, accurately uh, recreate the entire virtualization setup you have in production, then, again, you're not going to be representative of a production environment. And if you're running on a public cloud, well, good luck finding out what exactly the virtualization setup you're running on top of is. And this is syscall, so calls going down to the kernel, which are just getting you the time. That's a really common operation to be performing. It's a really common operation that a lot of monitoring tools may use, but it's also a really common operation that your software may, may just do regularly as part of its day-to-day -day processing. Sure. And the last thing is uh, when you have a development environment is actually being able to test against it, actually be able to, to exercise it with a workload that is representative of production's workload. And, and there's quite a few, if you're trying to create one of these workloads from scratch, there's quite a few subtle aspects 
uh, that make it quite difficult to actually do it correctly. So it's, it's basic things like, do you know what the distribution of your different endpoints are? Great, that's, n that's not too hard a question to answer. Do you know what the kind of distribution of hot, warm, and cold data might be? Right? And then we get into more complex things, like do you know what the interdependence between requests are? I, I used to work in an organization that had an SDK which would fire off some parallel requests to different endpoints, and actually uh, each of those endpoints required access to the same bit of data. And so you start to see all these kind of locking scenarios that a priori you, you, can't, you can't actually create from scratch. If you're able to get a access to significant production logs, so you're able to replay logs, you, you can create a workload that is similar to what you have in production, but there's, there are quite a few complexities around doing so. And actually being able to capture that data and replay it in a way that's representative is expensive and manual. So actually, that tends to not be done so often. Plus, there's obviously a lot of privacy concerns around here. You may not be able to take production logs and easily internalize them into your development environment without having other uh, both regulatory and privacy issues. Correct. And lastly, the, uh, as we saw uh, from uh, Jim's talk, uh, the, the JVM may be behaving completely differently in production. So uh, the JVM obviously does adaptive optimization, and if you, if you haven't exercised that code in the same way as production has been exercised, then you may not be actually running the same code in development as you were in production. You've seen this a few times, haven't you? Yeah, so one interesting example um, I saw of this was when people had a cluster of machines and they had a strongly elected leader inside their cluster. And their strongly elected leader performed a lot of business logic. And the followers in that cluster, they kept their state up to date. So when a failover happened, they could take over as leader and continue going. But they didn't run any of the business logic. Now, what happens in a scenario like that when you do get a, a leader failover? Comes over to, fo over to the follower. The follower suddenly starts running a lot of code that until that point in time, it had never run beforehand in time. You get di adaptive de-optimizations and potentially a big slowdown at that point in time compared to the way the leader is processing things. Great. So that's why development isn't production. Now which is going to talk a bit about perform uh, profiling versus monitoring. Absolutely. So I'm going to talk about, you know, having said that we don't want to look at development environments as a way of understanding and solving performance problems, we need to look at production as a place to do that, right? And I think I just want to kind of take the big space that we have of uh, uh, production monitoring systems and expand it and see where different things fit and where profiling fits into that, what it can help you understand and what the problems are with other kind of monitoring and production-oriented measurements. So the first thing that people start looking at when they're trying to understand performance problems in production is like ambient or we might call them passive or system metrics, okay? So these are just some static number that will be recorded periodically by your system taken back, collected, and processed, okay? So the kind of thing that Graphite, or Nagios, or Prometheus, or any manner of monitoring tools uh, will gather. So put your hands up if you use some kind of production metric gathering, right? That's a lot of people. Cool, cool. So a common metric people might use is things like CPU time usage breakdowns, things like that. Page load times, if you're looking at more user-facing metrics. Now. Metrics are very, very good in the sense they're cheap. So when I say cheap, I don't mean it's going to cost you less money directly. I mean computationally cheap, right? They take less resources away from the production system in order to measure them. System-level metrics can sometimes be very effective as well. They can often help you narrow down from a big set of reasonable problems to see that you focus on what's actually causing the problem. For example, are you bottlenecked on a CPU-related problem? Are you bottlenecked on a disk I.O.-related problem? Whatever's going on there. Okay, so they can be very good. But they don't necessarily tell you, right, this is what I need to fix in my production system in order to solve it, right? They don't tell you uh, where in your application code you need to look. They aren't directly actionable in and of themselves. Then there's coarse grain instrumentation. So what do I mean by 
adding some instrumentation to code, instrumenting code. I don't mean taking a big piano and shoving it in the middle of your data center. What we're talking about here is measuring time within a certain slice of code running, so adding some instrumentation at the beginning and end of a method, for example, seeing how long that method took, and taking, uh, and taking aggregating, and collecting that kind of data. So the amount of time your web application spends inside its controller layer, the amount of time it spends performing SQL queries. Now, instrumentation can be much, much more uh, granular and much more targeted than things like system level metrics, right? It can tell you specifically within an application where a problem is occurring, more detailed. But the problem with instrumentation based approaches is that the more instrumentation you add, the more expensive it becomes to instrument. So the more detail you get, the more visibility you get, the worse you're making your system perform. Then there's logging. Okay. Now, I'm sure at some point in time someone's just going to do like a whole talk on why they hate logging. I'm, I'm surprised Kirk hasn't done this already. <laughs> You've done several. Okay, great. Um, so what do we mean by logging? Just recording some arbitrary events and collecting, aggregating, monitoring those events. So it comes in a couple of different forms. We can think of the log for J, SLF for J, log back type stuff. So sometimes people can record timing measurements, put them into uh, system logs and aggregate them. So the problem with that is it's very manual, and as Kirk's mentioned, logging frameworks are generally terribly written and very computationally expensive, can rapidly become the bottleneck in your application. Then there are specific types of logs that you can see, for example, GC logs, which are very, very useful for gaining visibility into what's actually happening with, say, a garbage collection subsystem, but not so useful for other aspects of the system. Well, they, they, they give you visibility into a certain area rather than everything else. Then we come to production profiling, which is the kind of thing I want to think we want to talk about a little bit more detail as this talk goes on. Now, when we're profiling, what that means is measuring what part of your application is eating up some underlying resource. So what methods are taking up your CPU time? What, method, what uh, lines of code are allocating the most number of objects? Where your CPU cache misses coming from? What's, what's going on there? Now, production profiling is an easier to adopt way of understanding problems because it's automatic. You run a profiler, it does its profiling, you don't need to have any manual instrumentation step. But it can often have a lot of overhead. So we'll have a look later on at technical measures for reducing the overhead of production profiling. Now, I think one of the tricks uh, with these things uh, when you're looking at different production-oriented observability metrics, monitoring, metrics, monitoring in general, is the idea of understanding the system, but not overwhelming yourself. So it's kind of like you know, Goldilocks and the three bears, right? You don't want to have your porridge too hot. You don't want to have your porridge too cold. You want it just about right. So what happens if you have too little information, a porridge too cold scenario? Well, you just don't understand production problems, right? You don't gain the visibility, the observability that you want and you don't know if you're having outages, you don't know how to fix them very easily. But what about the porridge too hot scenario where you're gathering too much information? Well, there's a couple of different problems there. There's the, the needle in a haystack situation where you've got 20 different monitoring dashboards and lots of information, lots of metrics, but you don't know what to look at in order to find the actual problem. You get one of those, what, what some people call murder mystery style diagnostic sessions. That sounds fun, but what you're really doing is going around pretending to be Poirot or whatever and looking at these different measurements. Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Is it this thing that's wrong? Until you've exhausted all the different possibilities. Because as anyone who's seen murder mysteries will know, it's always the last person to be accused at the end of the wrap-up talk who's the guilty person, right? Um, the other problem that you get from the too porridge, too hot scenario is that you become the problem, or your monitoring tool becomes the problem. The overhead of collecting that data, aggregating it, can slow your system down, and your objective is to solve performance problems, not, not create them, right? Now, 
let's have a think about some of the common problems that people encounter when they use these measurements. The first one is unactionable metrics, right? So oftentimes, if you see systems that collect metrics, they provide beautiful, pretty graphs. Fantastic. Anti-aliased, some nice shadowing, lovely, lovely, lovely stuff. But they don't necessarily help you address the underlying problem. They don't necessarily let you look at that uh, metric and know what to do next. They aren't directly actionable, right? And another problem that you often encounter, especially when people start thresholding metrics, is this normalization of deviance problem. So has anyone worked in an organization where the following discussion has somewhat happened? Right, guys, some of our tests are failing. Should we fix them? Nah, we'll just ignore them. Who's hit that scenario at some point in time in their career? It's like nearly everybody in the room. I'm sure if we had shy people putting their hands up as well, that would be basically everyone in the room. You get a similar problem with triggering alerts from production systems, right? If you try and trigger really aggressively or really regularly, people just ignore those alerts. It has a really negative psychological impact. Either you ignore the problem when there's an actual problem in production because you're sick of these alerts triggering, or you spend lots of development time worrying about every individual alert when some of them just aren't problems. Yeah, You've I've seen this before, yeah, right? I've, 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 um, I used to work for a company in which they're, they're Berlin office, and they had these lovely big LCD screens on the wall with some, like say, pretty anti-alias graphs going on, a whole bunch of green lights and some red ones. And I say, I say to the VP of engineering, well, what's up with the red ones? He went, oh, they always fail. And then he kind of goes a little closer and goes, that's a new one. And the problem is it starts to, once, once you have some that you ignore, you, you just become blind to it. Uh, so it has a cost. What do you do when they're all red and none of them are green? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes when it comes to instrumentation tools, you see people go into a bit of a cycle there, especially if it's manual levels of instrumentation. So to begin with, they don't have much instrumentation going on in their uh, production system. So they increase the granularity of instrumentation. They add more things that they're measuring, more things that they're monitoring in response to the last performance problem that they've seen. Okay? So they start fighting the last war. Then they realize there's too much overhead from adding all these extra instrumentation problems. And they start reducing instrumentation granularity. And then they end up back where they started. Okay? So there's two problems here. There's not quite getting the balance right because the, as the, the granularity and the detail increases, so does the overhead. And there's also the other problem with things like instrumentation that you have to have something instrumented ahead of time. You have to know a priori what's going to go wrong. And if you have a problem, an outage, a retrospective, you agree to start measuring something, it's absolutely guaranteed the next time you have a performance problem, it'll be somewhere else, right? It won't be the thing that you've just spent some developer time looking into. It'll be somewhere else in your application that you don't have really good observability in. So surely there's a better way of understanding where performance problems are. Surely there are different things we can look at for understanding those systems. Can we avoid this instrumentation cycle, instrumentation dance? Metrics are really good, but how do we add actionable insights of them? So we're going to talk a little bit now about production profiling. Uh, which we think is a really viable way in, in 2018 to start adding a lot more actionable understanding to those kind of problems. Great. Thank you, Richard. So we're going to talk very briefly about production profiling. And let's start off with, uh, w let's start off with what profiling is. So Richard touched on this slightly earlier on. Profiling tells you what, what your application was doing with regards to some resource at some point in time. Uh, for execution time profiling, this resource is obviously CPU time, uh, and and the the information that we get at that point in time is is the call stack. So the 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 methods that basically are currently executing. Behind me on on the wall here is uh, on the projector is a what's called a flame graph, and this is a visualization that has been promoted by Brendan Gregg uh, at Netflix. It's a great visualization, and it's a way of uh, visualizing a collection of uh, CPU profiling information. So, so what do all those boxes mean in the flame graphs? Of the right. So uh, a box here represents a method. A box below a method means that that method is calling that method. Uh, so 
This is the stack going down this way. The width of the box represents how many samples, or basically how much of the resources being utilized by that particular method. So we start with 100%, and obviously it gets smaller and smaller. And this is a way of, basically, this is a kind of snapshot of a, of a, of a flame graph, and it gives you a way of visualizing that data. And we'll come on to, in a bit, how we, how we produce that data to get to these kind of visualizations. So let's start with instrumenting profilers. Uh, Richard talked very, very briefly about what instrumentation is. These are historically the kind of the oldest kind of style of profilers. Uh, instrumenting, an instrumenting profiler adds instructions to an application to measure the usage of some resource. Uh, and we saw Kirk earlier on with memory profiler, and that was an instrumenting memory profiler. The, the downside of an, of an instrumenting profiler, as we saw earlier from Kirk's example, is that the act of actually adding instructions to the application can substantially modify the behavior of the application. And how it modifies the behavior ends up depending on the kind of, uh, uh, ends up depending on how it uses the resource you're looking at, right? So it ends up being reasonably inaccurate as well. So for example, suppose you have uh, a little bit of instrumentation that measures how long a method took as part of your profile, or an execution time profiler. If you're adding that instrumentation into a really long running large method that takes ages to run, it's only adding a small relative amount of time to the length of that method. If you're adding that instrumentation into a getter that just reads a field value and returns it, then it's very likely that the instrumentation added by the profiler will take longer to run than the getter will itself. A similar, uh, another way that instrumenting profilers tend to alter the behavior of the program is by screwing with the compiler optimizations that Jim was talking about earlier, and which are so fundamental to Java code being fast. If they add more instructions and that method goes over a bytecode inlining threshold and no longer gets inlined, suddenly you have a very different set of performance. So, and so yeah, for those reasons and others, they end up being quite a bit higher overhead. Um, so we're gonna now look at another type of profiler, which is the sampling profiler, or statistical profilers. Does that mean I need to be a statistician in order to use the profiler? Not, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, so sampling or statistical profilers, uh, they, they stop the application or they interrupt the application at some point in time, at some interval. They measure the resource of interest and then the, the ap application continues. Uh, and for execution time profilers, this is we interrupt the application periodically and we grab a sample of the stack, right? So the, uh, and you can see a, an example of stack here, thread run calls this thread pull executor worker run and so forth and so forth. Uh, the overhead of a sampling profiler depends on, depends on two components. First is the method by which we interrupt the application. And, th and the second is the method by which we actually measure that resource of interest. There's a third component, which is how frequently we are doing that, but uh, well, we'll come up with that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. With a sampling statistical profiler, we do this. We do this at a certain. We take a certain sampling rate, and then we build up a statistical picture of the performance of the application over a period of time. So, how does this work in Java? Well, the traditional way of, of doing it in Java is that we there is a method, get all stack traces. And it, uh, well, unsurprisingly from the name, it gets all the stack traces for all the threads in the system. It'd be surprising if it didn't. Uh, there's a problem with this, though. Um, you, you can make a very simple profiler that basically calls this periodically. There's a problem with get all stack traces, though. And that is, it requires what's called a safe point. Now, a safe point in the JVM uh, is a mechanism by which the JVM can, can actually bring an application to a pause to do some kind of operation that, that, that would be bad to do if the JVM was still running, right? So uh, it could be, a, could be a garbage collection pause, could be a bias lock revocation, uh, there's all kinds of things. Get all stack traces causes a safe point. Uh, it causes the application to come to a, to a pause, the, um, the state of the application, the, the stacks of all the different threads uh, 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 return to you, and the application continues on its way. So the way these safe points work under the hood is periodically your application code goes and reads a specific value from a certain page of memory 
inside the application that will normally just be a bunch of zeros. And then the JVM itself can protect that page of memory and say, look, when anyone tries to touch this page of memory, run this interrupt handler, and then it bootstraps its way back into the JVM code from that. So they're very, very cheap if you don't ever touch them. They're all over the place in your application. They're very, very cheap. But if you actually need to get something like get all stack traces, you need to bring all the threads to a halt, it does need to stop the application while that happens. And they do all have to be at a halt, right? Yes. So it's one of those things where if you've ever been in a meeting and you're meant to start the meeting at like 4 p.m. And everyone except one person is in the room and ready to go with the meeting. And you're just sitting there waiting for ages just for this last person to turn up in order that you can get on with the meeting. That's a problem, right? Yeah. You often get that with safe point pauses. Sometimes you have a thread that hasn't quite got to its safe point yet, it hasn't got to its polling point yet, and everyone else has to wait for that one thread to catch up. And all the time between when the first thread hits a safe point to when the last thread hits a safe point, you're wasting time on that first thread, right? So the first problem is that by doing frequent safe points, uh, we are interrupting the application, basically. So there's impacts on latency and throughput. Uh, and for the more astute uh, um, kind of person who's paying attention, who's had their 4.30 coffee, uh, we've brought all our, all our, st all our uh, application threads to a safe point, and now we are taking the stack trace from them. Now, there's a problem there. We have a safe point bias. Uh, we are only seeing what's actually, we're, on we're only seeing the safe point nearest our actual bottleneck, because we can't stop the application uh, anywhere else. So there is a fundamental problem with get all stack traces, uh, which is a method that a lot of profilers use in Java. So you've got the safe point bias, and you also have the impact on performance, which really limits the rate at which you can actually sample. But don't worry. There's better ways. There are better ways. So the next, the next step, uh, more advanced statistical profiling, um, th 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 so there are, there, are, there are ways to get around the, the limitations of get all stack traces. As I said before, there are, there are two problems we need to solve um, when we're doing statistical profiling of an application. First is, how do we stop the application? And the second one is, how do we actually get the, the current, how do we measure the resource of interest? And for execution time profiling, that's the stack. The more advanced way of profiling in Java is that we use OS signals. So OS signals are a way of, they're a mechanism by which uh, you can dispatch asynchronous events which are then delivered to a process or thread. So what happens is you can say to the kernel, uh, I want to deliver this signal to this process. And the kernel will then interrupt that process. It will interrupt actually one of the threads on that process. And it will run what's called a signal handler. Right? So when you say signals here, Steek, you're talking about the same kind of stuff as you might use to kill an application, like kill-9, yeah. the process. So kill-15 right? would be sig term. Uh, so that's when you just do, uh, if you're, uh, you know, command line, you do kill, you're sending signal 15, which is sig term. If you get pretty aggressive and you want to do kill minus 9, that's sig quit, which means just get out now, stop doing what you're doing kind of thing. Uh, that is using the signal, signaling mechanism uh, to dispatch those, those signals. Now, the problem with, with uh, signals is that they cause a signal handler to be run. And, and the application thread can be interrupted at any point. So you have to be very careful as to what you do in signal handlers. You could be in the middle of allocating memory, right? And you definitely don't want to be mucking around with the internal state of the memory allocator while you're in the middle of it. So what you can actually do inside a signal handler is pretty restricted. Luckily, there is an actual signal handler safe uh, JVM method uh, called async get call trace. And this method is marked as being safe to call from inside a signal handler. Uh, they've been very careful with th this method and all the methods that it calls that it doesn't do anything that could potentially put the system into a kind of uh, into a bad state uh, if it's being called from a signal handler. So advanced statistical, uh, advanced statistical profilers for Java, what they will do is they will use an OS signal. They will trigger that OS signal when the resource of interest hits some kind of threshold, CPU time, war clock time, could be anything really could be using the hardware performance counters on the, on, the, on the processor. And then the OS will dispatch a signal to the, to the process. The signal will interrupt a thread. The signal handler will run, and we'll get the, the call trace. But crucially, 
all the other threads in the application will continue running. They don't need to be at a save point, they can continue going. So there's no, there's no interruption to any other threads. Fantastic. Great. So, how, so this is all great. So how do we, how do we get, get to use some of this? Well, here's some, some open source Java profilers. The, one, the ones on the left tend to be get all stack trace based, so they do suffer from the save point bias and they tend to be much higher overhead. Uh, so you've got the, the traditional kind of visual VM, which I'm sure everybody used, or everybody's used. You've got HProf, Twitter's got a nice CPU profile, which they use on some of their endpoints that you can, you can call and give you stack traces back to work out blocking stuff. Uh, basically anything get all stack traces based. Then you've got some lower overhead uh, Java profilers. They tend to be, uh, they, they, they don't all use async get call trace, uh, but they uh, all tend to be signals based and they don't suffer from the same save point bias that uh, the get all stack traces profilers do and they tend to be much lower overhead. Uh, you've got async profiler, which does some pretty neat stuff. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you've got honest profiler, which was written by Richard here. Uh, and you've got Java Mission Control, which has just been open sourced, um, but you, you may or may not require the kind of commercial features uh, on existing JVMs to use it. Um, it's unclear at the moment. Written by Richard and other people. Yeah, yeah. okay. So we're just gonna look at uh, what else is possible. So that there's been some really exciting stuff happening in the Linux kernel uh, over the last few years. Uh, there is, uh, uh, to start with, let's go for perf. Perf is a, is a mechanism by which you can access software and hardware event counters. So CPUs these days have a whole bunch of uh, profiling uh, performance counters actually on them. So you can say things, uh, really awesome things, like you could say, um, trigger this signal when I, I reach, I don't know, 1,000 or 100,000 L3 cache misses. Uh, or uh, trigger this signal every so many branches I mispredicted, that kind of stuff. Perf is a mechanism, uh, it's, it's both a, a Linux, uh, bit of Linux kernel code and it's a, it's a user space system for being able to hook into that and to be able to read out that information and also be able to do profiling based on that information. So Perf itself also uses OS signals in order to interrupt the program that's, that's being run, uh, but Perf uh, doesn't use the same mechanism for get all stack uh, async get all async get all call trace in order to warp the stack. It just takes the the stack that the OS knows about and just looks up some function pointers. Yes, uh, you can actually use perf to do profiling, um, reasonably low overhead profiling off the JVM. But to do it, you need to actually use something called perf map agent. So what uh, what this does is it actually emits a mapping file that maps the the native JIT code that the JVM produces. Uh, two symbols that the that Perf can then actually understand. Um, now, the advantage of doing this is that you can actually profile all the way from your Java method in your code all the way right through to the actual kernel itself. Uh, and that's, that's really awesome if you're trying to debug some really low-level stuff. Uh, eBPF. Now, eBPF is, is even newer than Perf and is quite exciting. Uh, this is the extended Berkeley packet filter. So the lin Linux, the kernel actually has a VM inside it with its own JIT, and eBPF allows you to uh, load code into the kernel uh, in a safe way, and actually allows you to associate that code with events from the kernel. So it can be uh, uh, probe sites being hit, uh, it could be network events, so BPF was originally the Berkeley, Berkeley packet filter, so it was used for writing networking rules. Um, but it can also be hooked up to perf events, now, why this is important is you can actually have eBPF hook up to perf events and do aggregations in the kernel. So a good example might be that you want to, say, aggregate all the stack traces. Um, so you want to interrupt an application, say, at 1,000 hertz, and you want to uh, make an aggregation of all the stack traces that you see every time you interrupt this application. With perf, what you have to do is you gather that data and it's squirted out to user space and you do the whole thing in user space. It's quite an expensive way of exchanging data, right? You end up doing a lot of context switches. eBPF, actually, you can do the aggregation in the kernel. So there's no, there's no context switching. And, and all that happens is the eBPF, at the end of it, can actually output the final aggregation to user space. So it's a lot cheaper. You can do things with eBPF that just wouldn't be possible with, with perf on its own. So it's a very exciting stuff. Brendan Gregg at uh, Netflix has been talking about eBPF a lot. I highly recommend you go to his website. He has lots of information about it and a whole bunch of really cool tools that are actually all eBPF based. 
Now, I was going to say, but Sadiq, it's not just the technical problems, the overhead of production profiling. It's also a lot of practical problems as well in terms of getting production profiling data back. Correct. Right? So we've gone through why, uh, why the, it's perceived to be that profiling is too high overhead to do in production, but actually with some of these newer tools, it's not the case. So why doesn't it happen? Well, there's, there's a few barriers to doing uh, ad hoc production profiling. Uh, generally, the, uh, the low overhead uh, unbiased tools, like the ones that don't have the safe point bias, they're relatively new. Um, the open source ones maybe been around for a few years. Uh, I know people are quite hesitant of putting new software, um, uh, using new software, especially putting it into production. So there's, there's generally been that kind of hesitation. Also, to do this on an ad hoc basis generally requires access to production, right? You're going to have to start and stop a, a JVM or uh, have some kind of remoting protocol access to it. Uh, or uh, be able to pull log files back and forwards and disable and enable it. And in many organizations, that, that's, a, that's a deal breaker, right? Uh, developers don't have access to production for regulatory or security or you know, many other reasons. A lot of those tools are also uh, tools that aren't really, automate, aren't really oriented towards aggregation and understanding that data. So they may well dump out a log file. You have to set the log file down. It's a log file per process rather than over lots, and you have to deal with some manual ar aggregation or automation of this process, it's, it's a fiddle. Yeah, so generally it involves manual work and people really don't like doing that. Um, you know, I, I've, I've worked in quite a few organizations where we've done this exercise maybe once every six months to a year. We found a whole bunch of wins from profiling and then we forget about it because it required a bunch of work. Uh, and we would do it more frequently if just the, the manual work put us off from doing it. But could we address some of these problems if we just profiled all the time? I mean, we can't do anything about how new the tools are, like, you know, time machine aside. Uh, but we can do something about access to production. Because if we're profiling all the time, we only need to do this thing once. We put it in, we leave it profiling, we put the data somewhere, and we don't need to have constant access to production for developers. So we can, we can kind of sidestep that issue. But also, once we... Sorry. I was going to say, also, we've got the data that's always on there, right? Yeah. What does having the data always on give us? Well, it opens up a few more capabilities for us. But if it's always there, we also, it's worth investing in the time to actually not make that process manual, right? Because it, we're continually doing it. And if we've always got that data, as Richard said, it opens up some new capabilities for us. So the first thing it, it opens up is that we have historical data there, right? If you do ad hoc production profiling, I mean, the, 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 there are two kinds of profiling that we used to do. Uh, the first was uh, every six months to a year, we'd say, hey, look, you know, those metrics for response time have crept up slightly. It's time we do some profiling. And then we do some profiling, and we see this as, as, it, as it comes down, and we address the bottlenecks, and then it kind of does that again. And then, uh, and then the other one we'd do is, is whenever an incident would happen, we'd say, okay, an incident's happened. Let's go do some profiling and see if we can try and maybe figure out how we triggered that. But if you've got profiling all the time, and you've got all that data, uh, then it's really useful for post hoc incident analysis. Our servers last night pegged at 100% CPU for a few hours. What caused that? I don't know. Let's go look at the historic data we've got. If you, if you hadn't uh, gone through the instrumentation cycle and you hadn't instrumented that, that, uh, the cause of that problem beforehand, then you're out of luck. Right? But if you've got that historical profiling data, uh, you've, you've potentially got the root cause of your problem there. You can also correlate it with the other data you've got. So you can say, oh, I'm going to take my 99th or 99.5% uh, um, response time, and I'm going to correlate that. And anywhere that, that looks suspicious, I'm going to basically look at my profiling data and try and understand why that's the case. I mean, Google have been doing always on production data for a while, right? They published a paper at it and talked about how they were keeping historical data in their situation. Yeah, They're so... a um, sophisticated organization in that regard. Yeah, so we, we, um, we'll have a slide in a second, that actually. Um, it's kind of based on their... Uh, what's called Google-wide profiling. And I, I highly recommend they, they publish an article uh, a couple of years, I think it's 2010, uh, and it covers how they, they do profiling all the time in production uh, and how they then aggregate the data and how developers can log in at any point and look at the historical data they have and, 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 and how that whole machinery works. The other thing it, that, it, that you have as well is that when there is a performance regression, um, you, you're able to actually, you have the data from a previous version to actually look at. Because one of the problems that we ha used to have is that we'd push out a new version to production, 
it doesn't perform as well, and we want to understand how does it perform against our existing, uh, what's the difference in performance, and if you don't have that historical data, it's not very helpful. So this is the kind of um, uh, pipeline uh, that the, the GWP paper talks about. Uh, the advantage of doing always-on profiling and actually doing it on everything is actually it costs you less, right? Because if you're able to actually run your profiling on all your servers, um, you can be clever about which servers you actually have profiling turned on for or what sample rate you do. It might be actually that you only want to actually profile a representative sample of your servers, right? So one of each machine type, one of each CPU type, one of each data center, or you know, a, a mixture of them. And actually, that means that your overhead from always on profiling actually becomes even lower. So the idea is that you take your samples, you aggregate them, you index them in some way, and then you're able to produce reports, right? And there's quite a few ways you can do this. So I highly recommend reading, reading the paper. It discusses how they kind of go about doing that. But when you say indexing, so that you don't just mean aggregating the raw data here, you also can think about adding contextual yeah. information, right? So we, we talked about that just, we mentioned it very briefly. Uh, once you've got that profiling information, uh, you can put it in context. So if, for example, uh, we, we said about performance regression earlier, wh why don't we just attach the ap current application version to, to, the, soft, to, to the, the profile? And then we can look at it and say, OK, well, uh, I, on, I only want to see the profiling information for this particular version of my software. Or I want to see the profiling information for uh, the current you know, machine type, or CPU, or data center it's in. Um, uh, Google go further, they actually attach uh, the binary kind of, or a reference to the binary. So you can actually say, OK, this, this is a pretty hinky um, performance profile. I haven't got the binary for that anymore. You can just actually pull that down and have access to it. Um, now that's, that's something that you just don't get when you're doing ad hoc, ad hoc profiling with a desktop profile. It opens up a whole bunch of new capabilities. So the kind of example of a, a feature some APM tools have that desktop profilers don't have and offers a differentiation between those two kind of things. So in summary, um, production profiling is possible. It doesn't have the kind of overhead that, um, that old instrumenting profilers or, or um, get all stack traces based profilers had. It's doable all the time with low overhead. There's a bunch of open source profilers out there. You should go do it. Uh, it's desirable. Um, if, you, if you do it and you do it all the time, it can give you insights that you just don't get from ad hoc. Um, and the problems that it used to have basically can be overcome. Fantastic. So let's uh, wrap up this talk as we're approaching the 5.30 mark. So we talked so far about a bunch of different things. We talked about why performance matters to your business itself, why you want to solve those performance problems. We talked about why development and desktop, laptops, weren't a great place to solve real performance problems that you encounter in production, how they can be different. We said there are a bunch of ways you can look at production systems and understand them but metrics, whilst very useful, cannot necessarily lead you to a direct course of action. And things like instrumentation, if you do lots and lots of instrumentation, can have too high an overheads to be usefully run in production. Production profiling can solve some of these problems around letting you narrow down where in your application you need to look at things, but without having such a high overhead. But in practice, many people don't do it because desktop profilers just aren't set up to work that way. But in 2018, we can. So Sadiq and I think you should have an attitude shift on profiling and monitoring. So hopefully kind of change things a little bit up on that front. We want to move from a way in which profiling isn't ad hoc at the moment. It isn't something that is difficult to do, has uh, you know, a psychological, it's, it's a real hassle to do type issue, to something where it's systematic, where you can just go to a website and say, you're right, done, there's the information, easy. Something where you can look at performance problems in a systematic way as well, and easily understand and narrow down and solve them. We want to think about being proactive, not reactive. That doesn't mean you have to spend loads and loads of your time on premature optimization, because that could be a problem. It means doing things like setting up systems ahead of time so you know when the problems happen, where to get them. It means uh, being on top of the game to try and avoid problems happening in the first place. And in terms of profilers, that really means being always on. There's just lots of advantages for running always on production profilers that you don't get from trying to have some JVisual VM stats D connection 
uh, to try and run them when you might have a performance problem. So if there's boiling this, this hour of the session down to one sentence, please do production profiling. Please try and do it all the time. You'll really, really benefit from it, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, now, I'll give everyone a chance to ask any questions, because we're happy to answer questions for five minutes afterwards. Uh, we run a little organization called Opsian, and we do have a system that does production profiling. So come and talk to us about that afterwards if you're interested. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for listening to us talk. <laughs> cool. Any questions? So the question was, how do you visualize asynchronous code? So uh, what we do at the moment is focus on um, regular, uh, I wouldn't say regular. We, we, we don't have a specific visualization for asynchronous code, as it were. I think if you're thinking about visualizing asynchronous code, then it depends a lot on way, the way that asynchronous system works. Um, if, for example, you have asynchronous systems that send messages between different components, Often what you need to think about is the uh, latency and overhead of the times between sending and receiving the messages between those systems. When I've uh, had uh, custom-built measurement for software that I've written before, I've kept on the go latency histograms for those different event types, broken it down into different stages between those asynchronous things, and you can see what's taking the time and what hiccups. And then uh, within those different components, it's just a question of, where is your straight time being used so you can, you can back off the flame graphs at that point. That's what I've, maybe there's a better way, but that's what I've, I've done I mean, myself. The, the other thing to look at is things like um, tracing and things like open tracing and that kind of thing where you're able to, to say, I'm doing some work for this particular span at the moment, or I'm in this span, I'm doing this work for this transaction, and it's able to reassemble all that into a, a bunch of uh, data showing the kind of latency for each step. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Morris. How much work have you done to measure the overhead of running running profile on the system? How much work have we done for measuring overhead? Yeah, to measure the overhead. Yeah. Okay. In other words, what is, what is the performance impact? So what's the performance impact of production profiling? Depends very much on your sample rate and what mechanism you're doing. So assuming we ignore like traditional desktop profiles altogether as they're just not going to work there, uh, we found with relatively low samples, we can get uh, benchmarking with less than 1% throughput slowdown for things we've looked at. But obviously, that will differ very much upon your sample rate and your application in question. That's profiling at a relatively slow rate. But you know, I think 1% is a livable overhead. You'll probably get more than that back from the visibility you have into your, into your system. Right. So wouldn't you say that if your findings are dependent upon the sampling rate, that you still have a bias in your sampling process? You don't necessarily have a bias in your sampling process. Uh, you just need to, you know, your, your level of confidence statistically is based upon the number of samples you have, right? Not how fast you're collecting those samples. I mean, when we say low overhead, we're still talking kind of 100 milliseconds or so. Yeah, so I, I recognize low overhead. Yeah, I mean, we certainly want to control sampling rate to do that. And if you're removing bias from it, then yes. You should get the same results just independent of the sampling rates. Cool. Any other questions? No? I mean, uh, questions what? for, it doesn't have to be just our talk, it could be any of the uh, talks as well. At the back. Is that supposed to not? Can you shout? Can you shout that? Oh, what's the best way to, to, to debug without logging? Okay. <laughs> I'll throw that's that one to you, Kirk, because yeah, you hate <laughs> your, your okay. Mr. Uh, anti-logging so crusader. Anti-logging. I'm, I'm Mr. Anti-logging. There's a mic there, okay. Um, okay, so you have to think about okay, exactly it is what you're trying to do, right? Uh, if you're logging, you're trying to basically capture exceptional cases. And if you're just logging non-exceptional cases, then you're really just journaling, right? 
And journaling is a different problem and has different solutions. And there's some excellent frameworks like uh, Peter Lowry, a good friend of ours, has written Chronicle. Um, and if you want to trace things and journal, like uh, you know, create ledgers and things like that, then then that's a proper solution for that particular problem. Uh, but for logging, really what you want to do is catch, capture the exceptional cases and push the exceptional cases out. And you shouldn't really have high frequencies as of exceptional cases, which means that the logging frameworks that you use are not really going to cause that much damage. But quite frankly, once you start using frameworks like Chronicle, you're going to wonder why you're using Log4j anyways, because um, you know that the Chronicle run at the, at the speed of hardware, and there's no way you can get any of the logging frameworks to run at that at that speed, and they'll run that way without uh, any significant uh, damage to performance, like you know the one percent overhead. Um, the other thing too is that you find is like uh, the, a lot of the monitoring in APMs and the problems with them, and this is one of the things that like the always profiling thing solves, and certainly it's the basis for uh, you know our di our diagnostic engine also is to try to measure. I mean, everyone here is sort of like application focused. And they're thinking about what's going on in your application. And, and ultimately, at the end of the day, that's the thing that you have to worry about. OK, what's happening in your application? But just, just like finding a performance problem by reading the code is probably the least efficient way of finding a performance problem, um, focusing on the application to find a performance problem is also uh, not very efficient. In other words, like logging to find a performance problem is very, very inefficient. And it's, it, you know, it, my last performance engagement, we, we just went through the whole logs uh, and everything. And at the end of it, it was like, uh, you know, just like what you mentioned in your talk was, um, you know, were the logs useful to us to find the problem? And the answer was absolutely not, because we were fighting, as Richard mentioned, yesterday's war. And tomorrow's war is going to be completely different. You know, what's it going to look like? So as long as you just keep adding more and more and more and more logging, then you know, you're basically what you're doing is you're just creating a huge profiler with a huge bias. And the bias is my previous observations. And, That's true. And really, you know, with always profiling uh, or with a proper diagnostic engine, um, what we're saying is that uh, we want to take all of the bias out of the measurement and look at the system in its totality as to what's actually happening in the system and then use the observations from, the, from that system to actually do a structured, uh, in some structured way to actually move forward from these observations to an actual diagnosis. When you get into that situation, you know, logging doesn't even play any role in that, right? It serves no purpose whatsoever and you can you know, rip all of that code out. And as I mentioned before, when you start ripping logging code out of your, out of your application, we typically see minimally 4x uh, improvements in performance or throughput. I was just going to add one thing to what Kurt was saying about oh, logging. Oh, you got a mic already. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, which is uh, a lot of people will do logging in order to capture production exception stat traces and understand where something's genuinely gone wrong. And a much more effective way of capturing specific exception stat traces is having a little record that's ha that keeps track of where those exceptions happening, deduplicates them, and just keeps a count on a per exception basis, rather than actually having a log that's continually aggregating. It also means that if someone finds a point in your code that can cause an exception, they can't DDoS your site so easily, which is quite nice. Um, obviously, writing that's a complete pain in the neck, but if you look at the Agrona open source project, has a little class in called an error buffer that does exactly that and just keeps track of those exceptions and can log them out to a file in a really efficient way, which is much better for that kind of thing. You typically only need about 15 minutes before the incident in terms of data, sometimes like about five minutes in ter of data before the incident. The rest of it is just making disk manufacturers really rich. That's really a, the only purpose. <laughs> Cool. And I think on that note, our time is probably up. Yeah. But we will we'll be here for more questions if you want. Yeah, but, come talk uh, to us. Feel free to find beer or whatever else is out there. I don't know what else is out I, there. I don't know. Yeah, neither do I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I say. Whatever is out there, just go find it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye.